right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to session this uh, meeting. <laughs> call to order this session of the Tacoma Park City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Stewart? Here. Council Member Sorry. Kovar? Here. Council Member Dabala? Here. Council Member Kostic? Here. Council Member Siemens? Present. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Searcy? Here. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any additional items. Uh, for this evening, looking um, ahead next Wednesday, our, uh, which will be on Wednesday, May 16th, we will have our update from our Youth Council. Then we will have um, the second reading of our 2019 tax rate, the 2019 stormwater management budget, and the 2019 budget. We'll have a resolution setting policy regarding the level of the city's general fund general fund undis uh, unassigned fund balance um, we have a work session on that this evening we have a first reading ordinance approving traffic calming on fifth avenue between orchard avenue and eastern avenue and we tentatively have scheduled resolutions for appointments to um, committees our work session next week um, tentatively is investment advisor presentation on socially uh, responsible investing and um, it is cited on the uh, uh, um, city website as a discussion of the draft resolution regarding Tacoma Junction site plan. I want to spend a moment and speak to that. Um, we will not be discussing the draft site plan, uh, draft resolution next week. Um, we're going to um, have a work session on Tacoma Junction to look at some of the key areas that we still want to consider the trade-offs. Um, things like the public space, uh, trash and recycling and how all that's going to work and a number of other things that we have um, been discussing. And so that will be a work session. Um, we are still awaiting the lights at the junction to basically settle down. Um, the traffic studies have been done. The counts have been done. The final analysis is waiting for those lights to settle down. And so given that, we are looking for a vote on Tacoma Junction to happen on the site plan in early June. As soon as I have more information, we will set the actual time, but right now we're looking at early June. So next week will be a work session on um, the site plan, and then hopefully uh, very soon we'll give you an update and more definite uh, dates on the uh, which we'll call it on the actual voting on the resolution. Um, while we're on it, since we're on talking about Tacoma Junction, um, myself, Councilwoman Dabala, and Councilwoman Kostic just uh, left a meeting with representatives from the Tacoma Park Co op, and we had um, an excellent meeting. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for now, but I think it was a very good meeting talking about um, next steps, um, some of their, uh, their needs, and how uh, the city can help uh, facilitate moving forward. So I just want to thank the board chair, Rachel Hardwick, um, and everyone who uh, came this evening, and I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation. So that leaves us May 16th. Um, moving forward, then the next council meeting will be May 23rd. Our voting session that night will be the second reading ordinance approving traffic calming on Fifth Avenue between Orchard Avenue and Eastern, uh, and tentatively a presentation on the Purple Line. Um, at the moment, the council is not scheduled to meet on May 30th. Um, again, we'll kind of see how things go with Tacoma Junction, but right now we are scheduled not to meet on May 30th. Then on Wednesday, June 6th, this is important, listen up, we will not be meeting here for our regular Wednesday meeting. Um, we will be having our meeting at the Tacoma Park Rec Center on New Hampshire Avenue. Um, and that evening so far um, on our agenda is a proclamation for Immigrant Heritage Month. Um, and so just keep that in mind, don't come here in June 6th. Um, so that's our agenda moving forward. Uh, we will now take uh, public comments on uh, voting items. The first voting item is the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 tax rate. So if you have public comments on that, please come to the podium. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, Paul Hubner, Carroll Avenue, Ward 3. Uh, I'm here to comment and say thanks, most especially to the newer women members of the council and whoever else finally negotiated a decrease in the, in the property tax. 
For me, I started work when I was 10 years old and paid for school and work for 55 years. Raised in some of the poor neighborhoods in Northwest DC, I struggled and fought so I would not be poor again as an adult. But concurrent with my struggles to succeed, I was given the very great gift of compassion and I've always tried to work with those who also struggle in our society. My perception of the insidious oppression of gentrification, especially combined with the present national administration, is twofold. First, over 55% of bankruptcies are the result of medical expenses. Yet many older Americans caught between utilities, property taxes, and home bills forego their medicine and treatments to stay in their homes, beginning a dangerous downward spiral. Second, and alternatively, housing and stemming homelessness are seen as a seminal step to reintegrate veterans, returning ex-offenders, the displaced back into mainstream society. So to, the step you have taken to decrease property taxes is a meaningful way to help people stay in their homes and stem the tide of gentrification and the unintended consequences of forcing many of the most needy people who have helped pay for and built our community in their homes. Thank you very much, and thanks for all the late nights. I'm at home, <laughs> but I know a quarter to 12 looks like. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other comments on the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 tax rate? Hi, Kelly Skelton, Ward 6, uh, 7506 Glenside Drive. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys again. Um, I really enjoyed the last council meeting, but um, I guess I still wanted to make sure that the council is aware of my concern about the reserves and fully funding them. There's, I, I mean, I loved the summary and our voting your voting item for tonight but when we decrease our reserves by over six million dollars I start getting a little bit concerned and I understand that we're not fully aware of the implication of you know we've never we haven't lived through the implications of the new tax regulations on individuals and I so I appreciate the council's caution and thinking for our, our very varied community but per capita, is it really going to save individuals that much? I mean, I know we're making a gesture, but in each family, if we just at least held the tax rate at where it is currently, could we not continue to just sustain that level? Because this will be the second year in a row that Tacoma Park has decreased taxes and decreased their reserves. And there are some projects that we're still funding um, and we're not even sure maybe necessarily exactly how much it's going to cost, like the library um, that we feel are important to do for this community. So maybe we can't fix it this year, but is there a way to create a fund to help older residents, lower income residents, you know, manage the tax rates at the level that they are this year? I, I, there's probably not time to fully delve into that now, but we want to maintain the community we have here. We want to maintain diversity, but we also want to maintain healthy finances. And so I would like the council to consider how we can do both of those things because I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not like I'm rolling in it. I'm not, I work for a nonprofit in Tacoma park. Um, and I have two kids that are in daycare, both in Tacoma park. Um, so, you know, it's I don't have extra money, but I would like to see a, a sustainable community, and part of that is financial security. So, I see you nodding. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any other public comments on the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 tax rate? Next, we have the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 stormwater management budget. Next, we have the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 budget. No other public comments on our voting items. Um, before I open it up to general public comments, I see a few more folks have joined us this evening, and I just wanted to um, let people know 
that um, I mentioned when I was going uh, over our agenda for the future that next week we will not be having a work session on the, resolu the draft resolution for the Tacoma Junction site plan. Instead, that will be a work session uh, to continue our conversation regarding a number of the uh, questions that the council has raised um, to get more clarification and also to discuss trade-offs on different things such as public space and traffic, uh, not traffic, but um, trash and recycling. Um, we will likely vote in um, early June on this. Um, the reason um, we're looking at early June is, as many of you know, the traffic lights timing in the junction are still not where they should be, they're not settled, they're not finalized. So these traffic studies are done, but the final analysis um, is still something that the traffic engineers are looking at. And so um, we hope to have that once the lights are settled. Um, in addition, I'm, as I announced before, uh, myself, Councilwoman Dabala, Councilwoman Caustic, um, sat down with Rachel Hardwick, the uh, board chair of the co-op and other representatives of the co-op, just right before this meeting and had an excellent meeting with them and discussed a number of uh, issues and concerns they still have and um, they're going to um, go back, talk to their board members um, and we're looking forward to continuing the conversation um, in the future. And so I would just say that that was um, a great conversation we had and I'm glad we were able to do that. Um, so with that, I will open it up to uh, general public comments. Any public comments on anything anyone wishes? Good evening, council members. Uh, this is Cricket. My name is Eric Sepler. We both work at Kinetic Artistry in Tacoma Park. Uh, although we have a small audience here, I'm sure we have people on TV because mm -hmm. that's how we see our our city functioning and yeah we'd like to talk about the uh, it's not a very long list but it, it's about it, it's about what we have experienced for our 46 years in existence kinetic artistry goes back one of the oldest companies in Tacoma Park now none of you have come to small business like myself to ask about what we thought about the development across the street, how it was going to affect us. Uh, if I may uh, address uh, the f folks here, Kinetic Artistry is directly opposite from the parking lot. That parking lot has been forever. Uh, so the city needed to do something with it. We put out a request for a proposal, and the Neighborhood Development Corporation said, we can do exactly what you want. Well, the artist's conceptual drawings that were shown to us, in my business, I can't put a proposal in and put conceptual drawings. I've got to show them sizes, spaces, uh, dimensions. Hence, when you promise somebody that they're going to do something and then they give you what you didn't really, that's called bait and switch. I feel that we've been captive with a bait and switch. Uh, the co-op was just talked about. When John Lennon wrote a song, he couldn't figure out what to call it, what to title it. He went to his mother, Mom, I don't know, what do I call it? She said, son, just let it be. <laughs> so with the, with the co-op, the co-op is a successful business. You've heard legions of people swear by the co-op. So let, let us support it. Let it be. Now, where do we go from there? We go to the traffic. OK, now, now Mayor, you just mentioned about the traffic studies. We're talking about, what, trucks, trash, parking. I got 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> You'll give me more? All right, no, that's fine. I, it's three minutes per person, please. OK. In front of my shop, we got a state road. We have a, a right turn only lane. If one vehicle goes, oh, I want to go straight, not right, the people behind them hunk their horns, mm -hmm. wave their fists. I've seen it for years. And now we're bringing all this traffic into the city. We're not prepared for it. 
Um, I'm not saying that this will pass or fail. I'm saying it deserves an I, which means incomplete. Thank Thank you. I think you understand. Uh, Cricket is practically speechless about it. (laughs) I wish I had Cricket myself. Hi, um, my name's Megan Scribner. I live on Willow Avenue in Ward 1. Though sometimes things are a bit heated here, I still believe that the two sides are not that far off. The key here is size. By having a smaller development, we could have it all, new restaurants, businesses, public space, and the co-op, and not exacerbate traffic and safety problems. I believe what we need is mediation with the co-op, NDC, members of the council, and a broad cross-section of the community representing all sides, sitting down and working out what we need and want for this space and how to best to address this. Some may say this is going back to the drawing board, but I don't think that's a bad thing, especially if it helps us to get this right. Speaking of drawings, this is my little segue. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and it seems that is true, as NDC has drawn many pretty pictures to convince us that this latest design is the way to go and that it won't cause any of the issues that concern many of us. But the problem is that the renderings used by the developer and the city staff to sell the development is that they're not drawn to scale. Now, that may be standard developer's practice, but even if it is, it's wrong. It's disingenuous to have us, you, approve designs based on drawings that aren't based on facts. How can we really ascertain the impact or even the benefits if we aren't given the accurate details? I also know why, want to know why NDC changed the design from three to two floors in response to the city's request, yet kept the same height of 40 feet. That seems crazy to me. Is it 20 foot each um, floors? And frankly, it makes me very suspicious. Please make sure that the height of the development is more in keeping with the two-story buildings that are around it. One more thing about drawings and pictures. I was dismayed to see the pictorial preview of the development in the Tacoma Park newsletter this month. At least the renderings provided by NDC concluded this disclaimer, not to scale. The city left that off entirely, entirely, so our taxpayer dollars were used to put out this rosy scenarios at best and false information at worst. These renderings are so inaccurate that the shadows even depict the sun as shining from the north. Really? Come on. I mean, you know. And while the newsletter mentions the two dates for discussion of the draft resolution and the adoption of the resolution, there's no mention that there are any, much less serious concerns about the development. I think this skews us in a wrong direction and doesn't make it easier for us to continue having a full conversation about what this is going on. um, It comes across as a done deal, which I think it makes it difficult. So please hold NDC to meeting all this council's resolution and have them show us, you, how they're going to do this in real terms, not just estimates or lovely drawings. And please take this to mediation so that all the issues and different desires can be resolved in a way that makes development we can all be happy with. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, Good evening. My name is Kevin Harris. I'm a former resident of Tacoma Park. I now live in uh, Four Corners in Silver Spring. I'm a member of the co-op, and I'm currently running as a Democrat to represent Tacoma Park uh, for District 5 Montgomery County Council seat. My work history includes owning a small business, building a technology company out of an incubator in Baltimore, and serving as a senior planner with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. The development of Tacoma Junction is a tremendous opportunity for Tacoma Park, to both strengthen the local economy and create a cultural hub for the community. Study after study demonstrates that the most proven way of expanding your tax base and creating good paying jobs is through strengthening local businesses. Over 83% of jobs in Maryland are produced locally uh, and 60% of these are very small businesses with less than 100 staff. For every $100 spent at a locally owned business, $43 stays in the local economy versus $13 when spent at a non-local business. If the businesses at the junction are not locally owned, then this valuable public land may simply become a pass-through for local dollars to flow to franchises corporate headquarters. I know that I'm thinking outside the box here, but that's what Tacoma Park is known for. Imagine for a moment a development that builds off the strengths of existing businesses instead of threatening them. 
I know that everyone is focused on the configuration of the lay-by, the traffic, and the trash removal. To those ends, I do believe the alternative vision presented by Community Vision for Tacoma Junction presents very viable ways to solve these problems. But just for a moment, I'd like to step outside the box and think slightly differently about how this public land could really be put to a higher use to develop Tacoma Park economically and culturally. Imagine that this development includes a commercial kitchen where people from all economic and cultural backgrounds have the opportunity to bring their dreams to life. Food production can be a step out of poverty for anyone, regardless of their economic or educational background. No one has to go to a fancy culinary school to create products from their homeland and take them to market. Imagine that in this commercial kitchen, food grown in the agricultural reserve is produced for sale at the co-op, a restaurant, and at the farmer's market. This is not a dream. Two of the greatest engines of economic development in DC, just a few miles away, our Union Kitchen and Mess Hall. I had the privilege of spending time there while developing my own catering business, and they were hubs of amazing creativity. Hundreds of small businesses have been spawned from these two commercial kitchens. There's nothing stopping us from making that happen in Tacoma Park and Montgomery County. I understand the frustration of many residents who want something to happen now and feel like the process has dragged on, but I urge you to slow this process down, take a step back, and recognize that once this development is built, there are no take-backs. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jessica Landman. I live in Ward 1. I'm uh, here this evening to talk a little bit more with you about the plans for approaching preparation for decision making at Tacoma Junction. Thank you for the information this evening that you are going to be postponing the vote until information is in on the traffic study. Mayor Stewart, uh, some weeks ago now, I think about two weeks ago, in response to a letter that I sent you asking about the process, the, the funding, and the sequencing of events at the junction, you indicated that you were close to having the answers to those questions, and I'm hoping still to hear from you about those things. You indicated that the analysis is not complete. Once the analysis from the traffic studies is complete, we need 21 days at minimum to consider that analysis because that's how long the SAJ has said they need and citizens need at least that long. We need a work session to be scheduled to talk about traffic issues. We need to understand the process for the city arriving at its recommendation for what is the prefer preferable traffic configuration. We also need an understanding of how you intend to sequence the project at the junction with construction of any traffic mitigation measures, because if one is in before the other, it will have a completely different effect than in the reverse. And so we still do not understand that, nor do we understand the funding mechanism, which you said you would speak to as well. Is it our money? Is it county money? Is it state money? Is it federal money? What are the imp implications for our, our budget? So a lot of these questions still remain to be answered. And what you said this evening about postponing the vote on the resolution is a helpful piece of information, but it still does not appear to allow adequate time for analysis and for a work session, at least one, for the community to understand the implications of the findings of the traffic study and to hear from you about what you are thinking of recommending as a preferred option. So I would urge you to think again about what the calendar is and to not have us have incremental announcements about potential delays, but instead to lay out the process of all the different steps we need to go through and then let the vote fall where it will fall once adequate time is identified for those different steps to occur. So I await the response to my letter, which you indicated would be coming, and I hope will address many of those issues. Thank you very much. Hi, Rachel Hardwick, um, president of the co-op board. We really appreciate the meeting that we had this afternoon with the mayor, several council members, and city staff. We look forward to continuing these conversations. We appreciate the delay on the vote um, on the site plan until June, and we appreciate that you want to see the co-op remain at the current junction. We also appreciate your commitment to get us the data behind the traffic study vote on the site plan. We also appreciate that you will consider 
we appreciate and will consider the city's offer of mediation with NDC, and we will get back to you in short order so we can continue to work toward ensuring we can get our deliveries, have adequate parking, and space to accommodate our trash and recycling. Thank you very much, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with the city and staff and NDC. And Ms. Hardwork, since you weren't here before, I just want to say thank you to you and to Mr. Anderson and everyone else who took the time to meet with us today. Thank you. I'm Susan Schreiber, Ward 1. Back a couple of months ago, I requested from the city clerk and received the emails regarding the NDC plan for Tacoma Junction sent by residents who took the time to write to the mayor and council during the period 2016 and 2017. In fact, the bulk of them were from July through December, some spilling over into early January of this year. I wanted, having been told by a council member that as many people favored the NDC plan as opposed it, I wanted to see for myself what the balance was and what the issues were that people brought up uh, when they talked about it. I read through and tallied them, and almost all fell neatly into two categories. One third wrote to express support for NDC's plan, in some cases talking a little bit about issues they saw, but really strong support. And two thirds wrote to communicate their concerns and reservations about what the developer had proposed. Many people asked that the viability of the co-op be a central priority, noting that the grocery store's basic requirements for unloading deliveries, trash and recycling, and continuity of operations during construction had not been addressed. People were concerned about traffic, how the development would, not, would only exacerbate problems for not only cars, but also bicycles, pedestrian, and pedestrians at a notoriously challenged intersection. Some asked that the traffic studies be expanded to include streets in the surrounding neighborhoods. Some spoke to the size of the building, too large, and many to the need for meaningful public space for community events. Some called on council members' attention to the city's tradition of support for diversity and inclusion. I want to point out that not one of these emails were anti-development. Everybody wanted something to happen at the junction. They just called on the council to get it right. Months later, the council has taken no steps to ensure that these problems are addressed. I, was, I came in a little late. There's a fire next to the red line in Brookland. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that there's no traffic going through. And I had to come from downtown. And so I, I'm very happy to hear that, the, that there's a delay in the vote and that that will allow us time for the traffic studies. And I hope, again, that full amount. But I know that we can do better than this. I know that we can. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cynthia Mariel. I'm aware that this week, the city council, mayor, and city clerk received a letter from more than from 70 percent of the businesses located at the junction. This is an important letter. Why? Because the businesses existing there, some of them for decades, in an area that is revitalizing on its own, have not been consulted by the city in a development that council members and the mayor readily say has gone on for years. How could this happen? Any researcher knows you understand context. You consult with key leaders before you plan for and go forth. I'm concerned because I see a trend here. These businesses represent the majority minority in Tacoma Park. They are the face of Tacoma Park. Yet, this city has chosen to engage a developer to prepare for voting on a plan that has not been done in consideration of the needs of these businesses. Yet, the goal of this development is what? Commercial revitalization for this very 
location for local independent businesses. Please explain this to me because I have a hard time understanding the choice the city has made to date to ignore these businesses. Furthermore, I have a hard time because I see another trend very similar when the design of the building that is currently before the city does not allow for public space. It is a pay-to-play design. This design does not include allowance for people of all backgrounds and income levels to come and use this public land. If you proceed on this plan, you, city council and mayor, are making a choice. That choice does not represent my values. It does not represent the best of Tacoma Park. You can do better. Please, use your leadership. Use your intelligence. Use your fairness. Be Tacoma Park. Um, hello, I'm Alice Sims, 7109 Carroll Avenue. I just want to say, I know so many of you all. I've worked on some I don't. I've worked on committees. I've done things. I'm your friends. This is not working out well. We need to have a meeting or a mediator or a group of people, everyone who's involved, and work together. This is just so on Tacoma Park. People are bad. People are, this isn't right. This isn't good. I mean, I go to parties now with with suppers and meals and na 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 I mean this is not the way it should be and where's the fire let's slow down and figure out what we're doing and meet with the whatever the key stakeholders or whatever you call them and and let talk to people so when this happens it's not you know Tacoma Park keeps bones of contention uh, if for years and years and years and years. So let's not let this be that. Let's work together on this and listen to each other, really listen to what each other has to say. I I don't feel, well, I do now. I've talked to Peter, but I hadn't felt very listened to. I felt kind of dismissed. I know I'm just one person, but uh, that's part of what's going on here. Any way I could help, I would help, but let's... Let's do it as a community. I hope. I hope. We can. We usually do. It'll work. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, council members and mayor. Uh, my name is Mike Royston, 11 Park Avenue. Regarding the Tacoma Junction redevelopment, I do not want to go back to the drawing board. I do not want to slow down this already very excruciatingly slow process, which has been very public, which is great. But um, I've never personally been involved in uh, going to city council meetings where a project has dragged out this long. The real reason I'm up here is to mention, talk about something that I've heard several other people talk about in past city council meetings. Um, I've heard people state that the new development will bring in businesses that will not be affordable to all residents. To that, I will remind everyone that the co-op itself is a specialty food store that offers many high quality, higher priced items that, are not, that not all residents can afford. I look forward to this project moving forward and uh, any schedule that you can come up with, uh, I look forward to seeing. Thank you. Colleen Cordes, Ward 1. Um, thank you for extending the time for this process. Um, but I really think that, I think it was Jessica who said it would make more sense to sit down now and figure out all the different steps that remain and schedule that vote way out after all of those things happen rather than continuing to tell the public it's going to be in two weeks, it's going to be in two more weeks. 
I think that'd be really helpful. Also, I also brought my copy of the newsletter with a similar concern as Megan. And as a former reporter, um, I, it's very painful for me um, and my husband, who's also a former reporter, there's a lot of journalists in Tacoma Park, to have a, a newspaper that we pay for. This is a very difficult thing to do for a city to put out a newspaper and not make it a propaganda sheet. So um, a number of times through the years, I've seen this go on the wrong side of that. I know we have a wonderful editor who I've worked with, and I, I, I know that when there are problems, I'm assuming it comes from probably the staff level in this particular case. But yes, it's if, as a reporter, you know, to try to, for the city to try to be objective about this, it's certainly that front page picture should have said not to scale. There's another picture on the inside that's not to scale. Um, also, it says that the wooded lot will remain. More accurate would be to say most of the wooded lot would remain. Um, it says it's two-story. A reporter would say, well, it's not really two-story. Most of it's two-story, part of it's three stories. So those are things that just stand out. I appreciate that the staff did not try to go into great detail, because if they had, it would have been essential to really get into the fact that there is a significant proportion of the residents of Tacoma Park who, yes, are dragging this process out because they're unhappy with what's on the table so far. So I thank you very much for the, um, for the extension of the time. And um, I, I encourage everyone to, yes, engage with the local businesses, with the co-op, with the residents, um, with the developer. Everyone try to work together to um, really address the many outstanding issues. Thank you. Hi, Roger Slagle, Allegheny Avenue. So over the past month, I've compiled this thorough assessment of how NDCs responded to the requirements that we set forth for them. And um, I've shared this with all of you, and uh, it's available on, uh, I know it's been posted to the Community Vision website, but it, it may be posted in other places as well. So I've asked you to examine that document and to request that the city staff respond to the individual issues that identifies point by point. Um, I feel that if NDC were vying for a job on a house we lived in and they handled their proposal as they have um, with omissions and inaccuracies and uh, gaps, uh, essentially moving farther away from what we requested, we would be nowhere near trusting them to proceed with the job. So I'm, I'm glad for the delay. Uh, I think in that situation we'd be wondering if they were presuming upon our trust and maybe even gaming this proposal to try to clear the maximum profit. I mean, they have to know that our master plan calls for buildings no higher than 30 feet in the junction. They have to know the actual cost of a parking space underground, which uh, the foremost expert on this uh, says it's 29,000 square feet in the D.C. area as of 2016. They have to know there's a more workable off-street solution for the deliveries in the trash that doesn't displace the bus stop and the bike share. And, and they have to know the true size of that public event space, event space, it's 1,052 square feet as I measured it with my millimeter stick. And I've written to the city staff and asked them to email all the residents with that correction. It is not 2,700 square feet. It's, we've been made fools of. And I'm really scared that we're going to be made fools of as a city if, if we don't call them on their bluff. We just can't let unfounded fears rush our decision making right now when the lack of clarity really cause, calls for us to slow down big time. And I'm glad you've decided to slow down a little bit. I mean, there's this fear tactic that we're hearing. Vote yes for this or you're stuck with the parking lot forever. That's the kind of pressure tactic you hear in sales pitches at timeshare resorts, you know? <laughs> it, we don't have to be afraid. We, residents, we've spent thousands of hours, volunteer hours, trying to get this revitalization effort right. And so we are not going to be stuck with a parking lot. So let's not be motivated by fear. Let's, let's be motivated by love for our community. Thank you.
Good evening, Council. Burn Kelly, Ward 3. Um, we have in front of us, as far as the co-op development, the junction development, the NDC development, the Purple Line development, the Johns Nevin Andrews School development, the Washington McLaughlin School development, the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital development. And we're trying to decide on one thing and lock us in for 100 years. Okay, 99. I, I, didn't, I shouldn't have rounded up. You're making a decision, and you finally recognized, even though you said we needed time to study traffic after we get the reports, similar to SHA, Madam Mayor, at the SHA meeting you attended, we are not in a hurry. Sam Abbott was not in a hurry, but he was determined. The majority, the majority, as was just pointed out by the statistics given to you by Susan Schreiber, the majority of the people who want development for the co-op site, the junction site, want what you have stated in your agreement with NDC to develop the site. And that's reasonable accommodations for the co-op, public space. And we have the talent and ability, we have architects, builders, landscape architects in this city who we didn't call on. We did not have charrettes over the design, like I have been involved with in so many other designs in College Park, in Greenbelt, in other great towns. But we did not do that, and we did not require that from NDC. We are not in a hurry. What we are in need of is a broad spectrum outlook of how many parking spaces actually exist in, in the city. Could we get developers to put a jitney bus system in? Are we going to always be bound to the car? Do we need a big parking lot beneath the ground on, to take up a fill space? Is that a good carbon footprint? Are we really green? Are we platinum? Are we better than that? Are we requiring solar panels? Today on the news, they're going to require solar panels. So there are many things that you guys seem to not be caring for or deliberate about, but somehow accommodating NDC's crazy pictures. I know how to build a 40-foot building, and I know how to put a mezzanine or lofts in there or squash courts or anything that requires a second floor of, of 20 feet. That's BS. That's a... That's a Possibly a four-story building, but because they're going to honor the, the first floor of real estate, uh, real uh, sorry, retail standards, it's going to be two floors and the opportunity to build inside of it. I Thank want you. you to be more considerate as you go Thank forward. You. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sawa Kumar, and I live close to the co-op. Um, I think the co-op is very important to me and my daughter because when we didn't really have a car, we would walk to the co-op, and I think that's that was very important. I also think the co-op is very diverse. It brings all, you know, people from all walks of life, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're black, or you're white, everybody wants to go to the co-op. And I think it's just, um, if you think of Tacoma Park, someone's always asking, oh, have you been to the co-op? Oh, what is it like? Can you get me this from the co-op? And I think that's very important. I think this new development will basically eradicate the co-op because the parking already, in driving is already hard. I used to take the bus and literally the bus will get on the sidewalk. That's how narrow the road is. So I'm not really sure how this is gonna go, but I just wish and hope that the co-op would stay and um, you know, con and just keep the Coma Park the way it is. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. My name's Nadine Block, and I'm, I want to bring, uh, there's a, been so many great things said tonight, I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, I'm in favor of a development that is more appropriate sized, as most of you know. I'm looking, I want to look a little bigger picture at what's happening on either end of Tacoma Park. We have massive infill happening at the Metro, which makes a lot of sense. 
I've been told that when the CVS lease is up, there's going to be a huge development put in there with housing and retail, another several hundred units going in there. We know that there's also another several hundred units slated for what is currently green space at the metro in D.C. So we have massive development happening in that end of town. We also have really exciting stuff happening in Ms. Searcy's ward, Ward 6. We have Purple Line going in. We have rapid bus transit that's just been approved. And we have zoning for appropriate uh, development there that people say they want. In fact, I spent last Sunday talking to people in Ward 6 who were, by and large, I'd say 99 to 1, supporters of the co-op, happy to shop at the junction, take yoga classes, go to the animal doctors, et cetera. And they were very, very concerned and felt very uninformed about the threats to that junction. And when we think about the, the development that could happen because of the Purple Line and other things in New Hampshire Avenue and the development happening on the other end of town, what we have is a mile in between from either end, a development that is already constrained by traffic patterns and difficult negotiations in that space. State Highway owns the, the roads. We have a uh, historic district issues. And so we have an issue about if we put a big development there that actually charges a lot of money for parking, has very high retail stores, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to sustain that long term. And I could see moving out 10, 15, 20 years, just about when this development should actually pay back, I could see a bankruptcy happening because people are not going to actually go into Tacoma Park because it's much more easier access to things on the two other nodes of Tacoma Park. So it makes more sense to develop the junction for walkers and for people who can support local businesses at that kind of scale. And so I hope that um, we take a look at the big picture, we get more information about the development that's happening at either end, and we really support smart development in Ward 6 where people are really interested in it. And we have the infrastructure that will make it much more accessible and much more appropriate. Thank you. Hi, council members. I'm Kelly Gibson. I live on Trescott Avenue, a member, um, a resident in Ward 2. Um, me and my husband have lived in Tacoma Park 10 years. I've been in front of the council a couple times about the junction issue. I'd first like to say that this junction issue has really connected me to a lot of my neighbors. We've spent the last two weeks every Sunday talking about how we can be heard and represented. We're not as represented at these meetings. In fact, I had to have a neighbor come over and sit with my kids because they're not asleep yet because my husband had to work late. And the idea of coming here and getting a sitter to come here feels hard, but we're, there's a lot of voice in the other direction here because their logistics are different than our logistics. So I'm speaking on behalf of a, a crew of Ward 2 residents. We are excited about this site plan, like flat out. We are really appreciative of the time you all have spent over many, many years talking about this and the process that you've brought to it and the patience and the comprehensive listening to your community. We're very grateful for that. We're excited about a, a few things that speak to even what the woman before me said, walkability. Those two sides of this city, I live right in the middle. We don't walk to downtown. We drive to downtown. We pay to park downtown. We frequent those establishments downtown. It would be great if we could walk to one of those right in our community. I'll speak for neighbors who have kids that are starting to walk to Spring Mill and Soul Food. We, we will continue to frequent all the small businesses in the junction. We understand that the traffic is an issue. We appreciate you working with State Highway. We know you'll continue to do that. We know you're not overlooking that issue. We understand that there are obstacles. But what we want to say is that this if we don't move forward with this site plan, we're very, very nervous that we go back to a parking lot for five more years. And five more years means kids go to college. Five more years means we don't walk to have drinks at the junction. We don't get to shop at the co-op, grab lunch for tomorrow, stop and have dinner, meet new neighbors. We don't get to do that. That makes us really nervous. So we say we are all in on this site plan. I represent you know, 35 Ward 2 res re residents, and, and we would all love to be here. but. Thank you for your time. We really look forward to resolution. We cannot wait until you take a vote on this. And we want you to know that our spirit is, is as loud as everybody's voices, and we are doing our best to get here to let you know that. So thanks very much. Hi, 
everyone. I'm Micah Bevington. I live around the corner from Kelly. I'm uh, one of the many people who also supports this. Um, I just want to echo what she said. And really, we are just on the edge of Tacoma. Um, it's not easy, actually, as especially nowadays, kind of getting all the way into the center of town without driving. My kids are now actually starting to walk. Um, I like the idea of a developed junction. I like that it means that maybe there are more places my young teen can work in a few years. I like the idea that I will have more than one reason to go there. I have been a member of the co-op for 10 years. I support the co-op. Um, I think I'd support it more as a shopper if there was more around it, frankly. Right now it takes a lot for me to turn right into that parking lot when I'm trying to get home. Um, sometimes it's easier just to head on over to Langley. Um, I would much rather frequent the businesses in Tacoma. I think a developed junction is going to actually um, make it easier for me to do that and for my children to do that and for my neighbors to do that. Um, what Kelly said, I mean, she's not kidding. We've had houses full of people who are really excited about this development. Um, you know, I've lived here for a decade and I love the idea of having uh, more diverse shops there actually too. Um, so I think it will make us a richer community. And frankly, we're a strong community. If we don't like the shops that are there, I'm pretty sure people aren't going to frequent them, and they'll be out pretty soon. But let's look at Old Town, where there are shops that are betting solely pushed out. Um, I know rents are an issue, but um, you know we can keep a business going if it's good. And I think if the, uh, if the co-op has a few more friendly neighbors there, they might do better in the long term. So I don't know if I presented it all well. It's been a long day, but... <laughs> Kelly's right. There are a lot of us who support this. So, Cindy, I hope we can, you know, have your support when the time comes. But you've definitely got ours for a developed junction. Thanks. Hello again. Uh, Kelly Skelton, Ward 6. Um, one of my neighbors referenced her a study that was of the number of emails that you'd received regards pro or con um, of the current site plan, and a third were pro and two thirds were con. The fact that a third of the people wrote in to say, I really like this, is kind of shocking, because normally people come out to tell you what they don't like to see and what they're not happy with. and. You know, there's a lot of new members on the council, so you probably weren't here at the instigation of this, and that's probably great because you're looking at it with fresh eyes. And at least in my community, we voted strongly for Talisha. You were like the first, it was like, you know, lots of counts of, we just all voted for you because we thought that you would give things like this and the purple line the attention that it needed. And I think that you will. And I trust that the other members have the same confidence of their their neighborhood. So you need to listen to your neighborhood. But at least in Ward 6, just like in Ward 2, we're very much at the very edge. We do drive to downtown Tacoma Park. Unfortunately, we pay to, but we, we pay to park. So, you know, there you go. We pay to park, we pay to have dinner. And it would be nice to have something closer so that we could take a walk. We could go over the nice, and we won't talk about how much the bridge costs. We will go over the nice <laughs> bridge and um, well-lit, you know, pedestrian-friendly bridge and come over and have dinner. But the extra mile to downtown really is an issue for a lot of us, and we would like to see a developed junction. And frankly, we have a lot of community space. And, the, and when we don't have community space, we find it, like with the porch uh, concerts that we do and with using the band shell and with developing the tot lot so that when you're at the band shell, you have the hot lot. I think we've done a good job of community space, frankly. I'd like to see some revenue for the other issue that I talked about, which is, you know, and my other very unappealing position that you should maintain or raise our taxes <laughs> so that we can fund the city and fund all the good things that we want to do. Maintain or raise, but that's just my opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any other public comments this evening? Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for your public comments tonight. Um, uh, now, moving on, we will have council comments. Any council comments this evening? 
Councilwoman Costick. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, the members of Ward 3 who came out to my listening sessions uh, over the past week or so. It was a great opportunity to hear from people and talk with people um, in a more dialogue um, opportunity. And I hope we can continue to have those in the future. Um, I think it would be something that would be useful to build on long term so that we continue to have those kind of community building opportunities. Um, I also want to note uh, a couple of people uh, referenced in their public comments today um, a desire for people to talk with uh, the businesses in the Junction area. And I want to thank um, the businesses for sharing the letter that they did with us. Um, I actually have spoken with some of the, the owners of the businesses in the Junction um, previously um, and was actually prior to that uh, letter working to uh, contact some more and try to talk more with them. But that's something that I definitely want to prioritize and I think um, <laughs> You know, it's important to talk with everyone and hear everyone in the community. So I hope that uh, they understand that that's something that we value as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to note uh, things have been busy, so we haven't really finalized the plans, but uh, we have tentatively on the calendar for June 9th, it's a Saturday, a um, coffee in the park. Um, I guess there probably won't be any coffee, but it would be a <laughs> coffee with the council member uh, in the park uh, as an alternative to sort of the, the traditional thing that we do on a Friday morning at 8 a.m. Um, rather than doing, it, doing that, we're going to um, have a Ward 3 coffee in a park on a Saturday so that uh, people can come out and enjoy the nice weather, hopefully, and uh, be in a different venue. So um, I will be in touch soon with some more details on that, but if anyone is interested, I hope you can mark it on your calendar now. Thanks. Councilmember Kovar. Thank you. Uh, two, two things. One, I know that some of my colleagues and probably many of the people here in the audience uh, were fortunate to be able to attend the uh, historic Tacoma's House and Garden Tour this past weekend. I went around to most of the houses. I didn't quite get to all of them, but it was the usual really great expression of the wide range of architectural styles and the creativity of the people, and yet a lot of the local architects who were involved also. So I just want to um, thank everybody at Historic Tacoma for, for doing that. Um, secondly, and I'll be sending more information out about this to, to Ward 1 residents, but we did have a meeting um, last night, kind of sparsely attended, um, where PEPCO presented on the work that they're doing in North Tacoma. And those who've uh, driven recently to um, Silver Spring during construction working hours of roughly 9 to 3.30 have noticed that it can be a challenge at times. Um, that project is going to be continuing on for um, over uh, a number of months, let's put it that way, and um, affecting us at least, our area, at least through the end of the year. Um, there will be additional detouring, um, but again, it will take place during the construction hours, which I think is uh, helpful on the part of uh, PEPCO. And so I will be sending more information out, and I think we'll probably post it on the, um, I think they're slightly massaging the PowerPoint that was, that was presented so that it's more easily understood. But they'll actually have on there roughly week by week as to when work will be done in different locations for those who live on uh, Tacoma Avenue or, or frequent uh, Fenton Street as a way of getting to uh, Silver Spring. So keep your eye out for that. Thank you. Councilwoman Searcy. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so quick update regarding Hillwood Manor Park. Um, last week, um, there was quite a bit of work that was happening there. Um, the uh, Montgomery County um, National Parks and Planning Commission was doing some maintenance work, um, and that actually included um, filling the sinkhole. Um, they were scheduled to repair the ladder um, and a few other things. Fortunately, I was engaging with, with staff while the team was out, which worked out pretty well because it was just pick up the phone and call someone. Um, also, last week, I've been in um, contact with staff from Tom Hooker's office about the park as well. So um, fingers crossed, we will continue to make progress um, in making the improvements there. Um, also, just a quick reminder for folks, the um, Crossroads Farmers Market has started. Um, it is on Wednesdays at Ann Street. It's like if you telework, mm -hmm. it's a great place to go get lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, the food is amazing. Um, it's just such a wonderful experience. So um, definitely encourage people to go out on Wednesdays on Ann Street between University Boulevard and um, Hammond from 11 until 1. Um, and lastly, I'm just going through my notes. Um, so in my update to residents of Ward 6, um, I put together a quick little four question survey for residents about the junction. Um, and I just want to encourage residents to please, please, please let me know what you think. I know how hard it can be when you work in DC, you don't get off to 6.30, then by the time you deal with Metro, the last place you wanna be is here. Um, so please um, take a few minutes, it's two minutes, to just tell me what you think about the junction development and what some of the concerns that you might have are. Um, and that's all I have, thanks. Terrific, Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming tonight and uh, voicing your opinion. Um, both about the uh, the taxes and also uh, about the development of the Tacoma Junction, and also to the people uh, that I've met with me uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, again, I appreciate hearing from all of you, and uh, you know, there, I, I sense a, a feeling from a number of comments that are made that uh, we're not listening to you. Uh, I can assure you that I am listening to you, but I also assure you that. Uh, from what I hear from my colleagues, uh, you know, voices are heard. It's a, it's a, a difficult process. Uh, both the taxes and the and the junction uh, development are both uh, uh, they're not slam dunks. You don't uh, don't just wake up and say this is a, you know it's it's A not B. Uh, you know it's a lot of uh, moving parts and and so anyways I appreciate your taking the time and working with us on this. Thank you. And I'll just follow up and um, thank everyone as well. And um, just send my apologies. I'm way behind on emails. Um, as many people know, I've had um, some family um, issues that I've had to address over the last couple of weeks. And I'm, I apologize. I'm just behind. And <laughs> I hope to make it up this weekend. But I also, it's Mother's Day, and I also help to spend time with my family this weekend because I need to do that. So I just ask everyone for a little bit more time. Um, phone calls, meetings, sometimes are easier. Um, so I am here in the city a great deal, always welcome. Love to grab coffee or something else. But I just, if I could just get a little bit more time on emails, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, let's move on now to city manager comments. Thank you. Um, have fairly short ones uh, this week, but um, as always, city manager comments are posted on the website, both on the agenda page and on the city manager page. Um, this week, um, I have information on the uh, proposed land exchange related to John Nevins Andrews property. Um, so when the um, uh, the daycare center, Central Nia, was looking at uh, purchasing the property. They, of course, had a surveyor uh, to prepare the, the, you know, do the checks that you do uh, before you purchase property. And it was clear that um, that there was it was discovered that there was a land dis that there was a discrepancy between the land records with the deed versus the tax maps and the way that we've always thought of uh, the property, uh, of the school property versus the Spring Park property. So in my city manager comments, I actually have a map that shows the areas um, that um, the city has been using that's really uh, the property of the Potomac Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, property that the school had been using this part of Spring Park. Um, so uh, coming before you uh, will be a proposal to do a land swap to make the land records actually look like the way we've used them for years. Um, and the uh, land swap is of approximately equal size. So it's really quite straightforward. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any um, legal issue related to this. Uh, we will do a work session, and then it's a two-reading ordinance because it's a land process. Um, but I, I know that people had interest in, in this, um, you know, what was going on. And I just want to... Um, let people know that we've looked at it carefully in order to protect the use of our park as well as um, to clean up the land records. It makes sense to do this switch. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about that. <clears throat> I also want to note that the outdoor cafe permit regulations, uh, the time of reviewing them is over. I have reviewed them and accepted them. There's an option uh, that the council 
can accept the regulations, modify, withdraw, or take no action. If you decide to take no action on the existing uh, regulations, then we will publish um, a notice about that in the newsletter, and 10 days after the publication, the regulation becomes effective. I have emailed to council those, um, those regulations as modified. The only modification that we made based on uh, citizen comment was to clarify that uh, within areas where you could be seated, there's no smoking or vaping allowed. Um, that actually is the case in any event, but we wanted to make it clear in the regulations that that applies. Um, there was also some helpful comments just as we would be reviewing a site plan, what to think, what to uh, look at. The one comment had to do with um, in some places when you get out of the car, if you're bumping, if, as you open the car door, if you're bumping into tables and something, that's a problem. That really is part of uh, us as our reviewing of an individual application. We will look at the design for that and ensure that there's safe access, and, and that would be one of the things we would look at. Um, so I think it's something that the council then can, you can determine if you want to take it up, but if you decide not to take it up, it'll move forward. One question about that. Yeah, sure. This isn't something I think should be taken up, just something I'd like to ask you about. Mm -hmm. So I just noticed when I was parking the other day on um, Laurel Avenue uh, by one of the establishments that has outside tables already, mm -hmm. and you can imagine the table could be set up so that people sit parallel to the road, or you could have one person sitting with their back to the road and one with their back to the sidewalk. In this case, it was with the back to the road and the back to the sidewalk. So really, the person was basically right on the curb mm -hmm. as I pulled in. And I don't know whether that's something that, it didn't look like it would matter to the establishment because there's gonna be two people at that table in any case, but I could easily imagine if somebody pulled in or was doing a um, mm -hmm. parallel park, they could <clears throat> hit that person with almost no right. effort. So, the, so that so, would be one thing to, to think about. So on, on Laurel Avenue, those aren't actually permitted spaces. I mean, they kind of are under a, an informal process, but under this, it would be more regularized. Right. So we would look at, at how that was laid yeah. out. And it might just be that they should only Move do the parallel ones right. or whatever. Yeah. It, that may be a good idea. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question on that? Can I just have a quick, could you just give um, a brief uh, overview of what's happening with the retiming of the lights in the junction? I know a lot of people <laughs> yeah. are interested in that. <sighs> Talk about something that takes a lot of staff time and we're not yeah. in responsible. Um, the, so as, um, the county is, has been taking over the signalization at the, at the junction, um, several lights and the pedestrian signals. And in doing that, um, apparently it's much harder than it would seem to do to uh, get the timing um, even back to the way it was, but to try to make it so that it works well. Um, and each time you tweak something, it has a different kind of ramification and they're monitoring that. Um, so there was a time when some parts worked really well, um, but others didn't and they tweaked them. Uh, now we get reports of long uh, queues on Ethan Allen and Carroll Avenue, and there still is um, some concern about areas where, uh, especially near the fire station, pedestrians used to uh, not have cars turning while they're walking across the street, and now they are allowed to, um, cars are allowed to turn, but because they've not done that in the past, people have a pattern. And so um, they're experimenting with different timings of that. We have signs up to try to warn people to please watch out, be careful as you go through there. <clears throat> Even in the same day, things could be different because they're experimenting with it. Um, I am not sure how much longer this is going to go on. Um, I had heard at some point that it would have been over last week and then by today. My guess is it's probably another week where they're trying to adjust them. <clears throat> I do appreciate when people have particular information that they can share when it was a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's not that useful to say, oh, the lights are terrible. Mm -hmm. It's great to say, gee, at 7.15, it took 10 minutes on Carol or you know, in this segment, going this direction, something like that, so that we are able to convey that information to the county folks who are tweaking them, and they, can, and they can look specifically at that. So I encourage people to continue to write in. They can write to me. Uh, we'll pass it along to the county folks that are doing those adjustments. It's the best I can say. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's actually, the thing I think that was particularly frustrating, <clears throat> and I did convey this actually to the 
State Highway Administrator, was that um, it wasn't conveyed to us what all's involved in the switchover, and there was no signage out to say, this is what's going to happen, please be aware. And so finally, you know, oh, 10 days after it started, we have signs out there. Um, so that was a, the thing that was most frustrating about it, I think, is that there wasn't the heads up given that there were these changes that were going to happen. <coughs> I'm hoping that it will get better. Okay. Any other updates? Yeah, I just want to give a kudo to uh, Lucy Naher for her work mm -hmm. uh, with the five, TKPK 5K and then today again with the Bike to School Day. Right. <laughs> yes, we, we all, mm -hmm. she's, she's wonderful and uh, it was uh, a great success and the weather couldn't be better so that was really nice. I know, I was really upset I had to miss the 5K on Sunday. You missed it? Yeah, I was still oh, coming back from that's Florida. Right. So. That's right, that's oh. right. Yeah. yeah, no, it, it, was, it was very popular. Yeah. So I know I, my, I had to get my T-shirt because I have the whole. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, I want. Even though I get to run, I'll, I'll let Lucy know that yeah, you're missing yeah, one. I'm missing a was... set, one of my set. Great. All right. Um, let's move on now to our <coughs> voting session. Um, uh, the three items we have to vote on tonight. Um, the first is the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 <coughs> tax rate. Uh, the city manager wanted to speak to this. Yeah, I'd like to say a few words first. Um, the process of preparing the budget is a difficult one, and I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful finance director, Susan Chung, as well as excellent department heads and other staff who make the process go as smoothly as possible. And they really worked hard. I really appreciate it. As I've mentioned before, it was more difficult than in past years to come up with a proposed budget that met the council's goals as set in the retreats last January. This year, I also took into consideration work that is before the city, whether we like it or not, such as the purple line and the moving of the hospital. The reduced revenue we had this year due to the um, FY18 tax rate that was cut below the constant yield level. The uncertainty of the economy and the impact of the federal tax law changes. Concern for the residents and their ability to pay increased taxes. And the need to protect the city's reserves at at least a minimum level. I know that you, the council, also struggled with your decisions on the proposed budget, and I deeply appreciate the care and thought that you gave to both individual components and to the overall budget while weighing the comments and expectations of your constituents. One of the council's goals is financially sustainable city government with a special emphasis on reserves. And I'd like to touch on that subject uh, briefly this evening. Um, First, there is a resolution on the work session discussion this evening that concerns the general fund unassigned fund balance. It's, it's what we usually think of as our reserves. Mm -hmm. It would set the minimum for this fund balance at 17% of the general fund revenues for the year when adopting a budget. If there is a special circumstance where it is not possible to meet that 17% level, the council would need to identify that situation in the budget ordinance. There is a provision in the budget ordinance before you tonight that addresses the small level of unassigned fund balance this year. Second, we had a discussion about the equipment replacement reserve and whether a $700,000 contribution was appropriate or should it be the $780,000 that was called for through the ERR spreadsheet. <clears throat> there are a number of reasons why this formula is imprecise, but it may make sense to set a policy regarding this reserve fund as well. I'm glad the council is as committed as I am to adequately funding this special reserve fund. Staff work is also being done on clarifying the facility maintenance reserve and what it should include, and we'll be bringing some of that information before you in the future. And finally, the additional $100,000 contribution that I proposed for the police pension fund is being cut to $50,000 for FY19. This is above the actuarially recommended amount, so I'm not overly concerned with the reduction, although I would prefer the larger amount given the percent of the pension that is unfunded. As you look through your packet on the budget ordinances, you may have noticed that there was a reduction made in the speed camera fund. This is because the funds for the police pension are tagged to each officer, not as a bulk. So the amounts associated with the two officers paid from the speed camera program were reduced, as well as the amounts for officers in the police department budget. One of the biggest asks I had of the council for the FY19 budget was five new positions. That is a huge ask. 
I appreciate that three of the positions were approved. As we move forward through the year, I will be alerting you to the work that the staff is not able to handle and will ask you to help in prioritizing the work programs when needed. I will also be very firm in insisting that managers and other supervisors attend to the administrative work they need to do that is separate from project work. For example, attention to employee evaluations will take precedence over discretionary work. Around next Valentine's Day, the city will receive the information for next year's constant yield number based on the triennial proper property assessments that will be done in December of this year. We will have a lot to consider next year. As I have mentioned before, I'm honored to serve with an attentive and thoughtful city council and with simply wonderful professional staff. And I kind of look forward to next year's budget. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So the items are before you, and I think um, we'll just kind of take them in order, and yep. if you've got questions, that's fine. Terrific. Would someone like to move the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 tax rate? So moved. Oh, I got it. Council Member Smith moved. Council Member Seaman second. Would anyone like to speak to the tax rate or um, ordinance or have any questions on that? Councilwoman Searcy. Um, so I just want to reiterate um, behind the scenes, I, I, I felt that there was a way for us to still lower the tax rate but make um, some additional contributions to the reserves. I think it is critically important um, that we as a council not just think of the needs for today, but also focus on um, the city's viability in the future. And there's a lot of unknowns this year, um, which makes it particularly hard to anticipate what tomorrow may bring. Um, but I definitely think that it's important for us, even if we're not able to do it this time around, um, to really set a goal as a council for ensuring um, the appropriate level of reserves um, that, that we need in order to ensure the fiscal viability of the city. Um, again, there's a, a plenty of unknowns. <laughs> um, and I don't want to be very chicken little. Um, but given the large scale projects that are happening, um, it's important for us to make sure that there are enough dollars that, are, that we have available to us if we should need them. Thanks. Councilmember Dabala. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> I had a question about the personal property and the railroad and public utilities um, <clears throat> in terms of how those num what, what kind of control we have over those numbers. Actually, you can set them. We just didn't have a discussion about them. This is the tax rate that we've had for some time. Um, I think with the personal property tax, um, you know, we were looking at taking out the inventory tax um, portion as of FY20, um, and so it didn't occur to me to, like, bring up, did you want to adjust the actual rate? Mm -hmm. um, and on the railroad and utilities, um, we don't really have a yeah, kind of so system for what we these. want to do, and that may be a really good discussion for an upcoming year. Okay, and, real, and the public utilities is a pretty small portion. Of the That's revenue, right. It's not very much. It's not very much money. It's a little bit more. Right. Okay. Councilman Kostic. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to first of all thank uh, the city manager and the staff for all of the work on the budget um, and answering our questions and my many questions as a new council member going through mm -hmm. this process. Um, I echo uh, council member Searcy's comments about the reserves, and I'm glad that we're having the conversation about that. Um, Looking forward to next year, I think it would be really helpful if we can have thorough information about the reserve levels during our reconciliation process. I know we were kind of looking at that spreadsheet um, during the process, and, and it seemed like some of the calculations with the spreadsheet weren't necessarily accurate when we were adjusting things. Um, so I think uh, it would be oh, helpful. Yeah, we're we're going to change that. Yeah, I think yeah. it would be helpful to have, have an opportunity <laughs> no, we, to really we, see that right, and have right. that be part of the conversation. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And on the tax rate, I'll just note that, um, one, I want to thank the st uh, city staff um, for answering all the questions, putting together the budget this year. Um, and for me, when, when I think of um, the tax rate, um, I think of stability. I think of um, for us as a council to be able to plan and to make sure that residents can plan. Um, so um, 
as Kelly, as uh, she mentioned before, um, I always like the idea of starting at um, where we are <laughs> um, and possibly adjusting for inflation. Last year, I voted against our tax rate because I felt we had um, gone too far below, and um, and I knew this year we were going to have to um, make some really tough decisions. Um, and so um, I will be voting this year for the tax rate, but I also uh, do think that as we are moving forward, um, I'd like to think about how we may be able to do like multi-year budgets and really be thinking about, you know, this kind of stability across the board. Um, and when I look at the chart for our tax rate, I actually don't like the fact that it goes up and down on that bar chart. I would like to see something much more um, smooth out and for us to be planning that. Um, and I completely, 100% agree on the reserves, <laughs> as my colleagues know. Um, so, Councilmember Kovar. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to reiterate something that I mentioned when we voted um, last week, that um, in addition to the kind of discussions that we'll be having today uh, and voting next week, I suppose, on the um, reserves that we also um, and, and what the mayor mentioned, that we look a little bit more closely at how we funnel our council priorities into mm -hmm. the budget because, you know, you're only human when you mention something as a priority and we get the support from the staff and it ends up in the budget. But I think there ought to be a clearer understanding of the trade-offs for what are the costs, whether it's just additional staff time because any staff time is time that can't be spent on something else, as, as you were just referring to. Uh, so I think as the budget is assembled, I think it will be helpful for us to understand of the various things that we've designated as priorities within the priorities document, which I think that whole process in the document is really helpful to us, just to understand, okay, you've asked for these things, what is their cost? Do they have a benefit that can be calculated from them? And then we, that can help us, I think, assess which things um, should be priorities for that given year, which other things should maybe be remain on the list but be put off until later. So I just think having that kind of discussion for how to develop the alternatives, I think, is something mm -hmm. that would be helpful, too. And we've talked about it, yep. but I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Uh, I just want to thank the staff for uh, putting together the budget. I want to thank my colleagues for holding the line on the tax rate. I think it's really important uh, that we don't increase taxes. Uh, there was a recent report uh, in Market Watch that says out of the 50 states, Maryland is the only state that will have deteriorating economic activity in the next six months. So there is something going on uh, in the economy uh, that, that is not positive. So I think this is the time that uh, we have to be very careful in, in increasing the taxes on our residents. Thank you. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, I would like to thank everyone for uh, bringing this together, and, and uh, it's been a uh, pleasure working with this council and, and putting the budget together also and, and uh, making all those difficult decisions that uh, they come up at this time. I, um, I look forward to discussion on reserves. I think that's an important thing that I'm disappointed that uh, uh, where we are right now, but I think uh, as we move forward, I'm glad we're going to be talking about that. And um, um, well, that's all for now. <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. All right. All those in favor of uh, adopting the FY 2019 tax rate, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Next item the, is the first reading ordinance adopting uh, Mayor, the. Oh. Let me just. For the record, say yeah. what the right rate is. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it's going. It will be set at 52.91 cents per hundred dollar assessed valuation. So, um, just That's it. it's good to like actually say it out loud. So, yeah. <laughs> I realized I hadn't done that. And this year we got two decimal points, so we don't drive you. Well, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some years that, you that do extra it. one. I, know, I was like, I, know. I, I was trying to say, think, could I like, if I round down? <laughs> and then I was like, no, I still need that money, so yeah. I, I didn't. All right, next is the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 stormwater management budget. And um, have someone move that? I think you have to call yourself. Oh, as I think. Oh, okay, board, it wasn't on the right? That's right. So I, I don't think we didn't we didn't put that highlight there, but I think right. I think you're right. Actually, right. Um, so uh, would someone like to move for us to convene as the stormwater management board? Sure. Councilwoman Dabala, do I have a second? Second. Councilwoman Searcy, any conversation about that? 
All right, all those in favor of um, voting to be the Stormwater Management Board, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, we are now the Stormwater Management Board. Now, <laughs> um, would someone like to move the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 Stormwater Management Budget? I'll move it. Councilwoman Caustic, movement. Second. Councilwoman Siemens, second. Any questions or <laughs> Councilmember Siemens? Did you? No, that's fine. Oh, that's fine. Um, well, I got uh, some lights on here. Um, Councilman Dabala. So I was I was going to save all my thank yous at, on the on the budget for the third uh, ordinance, which is actually the budget. But right. this this staff's been wonderful, and I've really enjoyed working with all of you. And I'm very pleased that we were able to get where we were at. Looking forward to even more improvement in the process next year. Um, I did have one very specific question on the stormwater management mm -hmm. fund um, because it, it, there's a, a section for there's fifteen thousand nine hundred and fifty six dollars right. fund back with, what, with that big a budget. We needed to. So what, does so it, what is that? So basically, all of our budgets have to be equal, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so in order for the budget to be the amount of activity that we intend on spending on stormwater right. projects, is fifteen thousand nine hundred and fifty-six dollars less than how much we would get in stormwater revenue this year but there is a fund balance in the stormwater fund so we're using that fifteen thousand dollars from the stormwater fund to make it balanced. So you're telling me it's bookkeeping? It's a bookkeeping Thank item. You. Councilwoman Searcy? Um, so I know I've been going back and forth with with you and um, Daryl about um, there's a a large number of stormwater projects that are happening in Ward 6. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is um, relates to the Hillwood Manor Park. Um, so what would be, and, but that one is an out year like FY 23. Would it be possible, not for this, not for this year, because I don't want to muck around with that, mm. but <laughs> for, for FY 20, like, so it seems as if the, um, some of the, the line items is kind of at a, at a constant of like 250000 And I wasn't sure if that's because that's how much we have to actually put or, you know, is there flexibility in terms of the amount and whether or not we can bump priority projects up in terms yeah, of timing? There's, there's actually quite a lot of flexibility. Um, there are some things that um, we know the time is coming and we have to do them, um, but it's a great conversation to have. Um, as we as we look in that CIP, you know what what in the out years, and so if there's um, some things, we often move things around as we get close to budget time, and so I think you know you've put that little click in there. We'll keep looking at it, um, and um, you know sometimes you can't do everything just by the nature of either the money or the capacity, um, but there's usually some flexibility, and I'm happy to have that conversation with the council about how to look in some of the out years for the stormwater budget. It seems like a great discussion for the council. Okay, great, thank you. Council Member Kovar. Yes, thank you. Um, can you just say a few words, would you mind, uh, for the city manager, about the survey that we were going to do to analyze the... You know, uh, I don't know the status of it. I okay. know stuff was underway. I think I don't think Ms. Yes, um, no. Brayley is here at the moment, but I'll get okay. something if back to the council. Okay, we can get back on that. Yes. Ab absolutely, Thank I'm looking you. forward to so it. So that's too. just a survey to look at whether there is another way of calculating what various uh, property owners that's right. would pay is, based on the that's size right. of their it does two impermeable service and That's so on. right. So one of it is it gets an up-to-date mm -hmm. um, identification of how much surface area is impermeable and then, you know, by property, and then that can give some pretty good inf information potentially on some different ways of calculating it, which, um, you know, we do want to find ways that benefit those who are doing more to help right. the stormwater system. Right. Okay, thank you. Great. All those in favor of the first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 stormwater management budget, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Next, first reading ordinance adopting the FY 2019 budget. Who would like to move that? Councilman, Councilman Smith and Councilwoman CRC second. Any questions or comments on this? Councilwoman Dabala? Yeah. Um, the, 
I have a couple of questions, and I know that some of them I asked before, and maybe I'm just being a little dense here. Um, but my first question is a new one. Uh, on the first page, one, two, three, sixth whereas, is that intended to apply to every year, or is that intended to apply to this year, in which case let's put fiscal 19 in there? So what I did was I went, I, I took the liberty of adding to a standard budget ordinance, as what I mentioned before, of referencing the resolution that would be discussed by you at work session and potentially voted um, on by you next week that um, identifies uh, where we stand on putting 17% of the uh, an, equivalent, an equivalent amount of 17% of the general fund revenue um, as the target for the unassigned fund balance for the general fund. So merging the two resolutions. So what the, what the um, resolution calls for is on those years when we can't do the 17% mm -hmm. to specify that fact in the budget ordinance and kind of the reason why it's still why we still are protected, uh, or if we're not, be very upfront about that. Um, and so um, even though you don't vote on the resolution till next week, this is a two-reading ordinance, so it, I wanted to have it as part, of the, as part of this tonight for you to consider. So it, it looks premature, but after another hour or so, it won't be. Uh, after next, minutes. after no. next, <laughs> <laughs> after next Wednesday, it won't be. It won't All be. All right. So let's let's. But that's that. but that's okay. why it's it's in here um, as at first reading so that you can consider it and see how it relates to the resolution later. Okay. The other, um, two other questions. Um, one is on the blue sheets. Just for those who are at home reading aloud, reading along, it. On the first page, it says this that the budget is 38 million and the revenues are 32 million, and that leaves a lot missing. Right. But it's not really missing. It's explained a little further when you talk about the fund balance and That's how right. that works mm -hmm. out. That's right. So, my first question is, um, how does taking remind me how does taking six million out of the fund balance compared to what we typically do? Because typically, you typically some comes out. At, Every year, right? That's right. Okay. Um, but, not, but maybe not quite that much. Yeah, this last year it was also fairly large, but then okay. we didn't spend some because of the library. So mm -hmm. part of this has to do with just the, you know, some of the timing on, on when we use certain funds. Yeah. Okay. It's well, a large amount this year. I, would, I mean, yeah. I mean and, that's and part I of that's to, part of the comments that we've been making mm -hmm. is that this is unusual year. Right, and I, it, right. I just wanted to yeah. to make sure everybody understood that. And then when I put it all together, there are a couple of different places where there are intergovernmental revenues, and one is in the general fund, and that's the county reimbursements, right. the, the so-called tax duplication. But then there's a whole section called special revenue and a lot of that is intergovernmental and that is essentially grants that's right okay. yes yeah, so when we refer to interjurisdictional funds we don't use this we don't count the special revenues in that we count that separately but if you look just at the interjurisdictional funds the that go into the general fund it's 28 percent of our revenue it's a big portion of our revenue it's it's much more than we get by income tax um, and so, um, so that's part of the reason we pay a lot of attention to it. This year, the special revenue budget, which is grants, is five million bucks. Anticipating, my and next so question. that's a large amount. We appreciate that grant money. They go to the major projects, the road projects, primarily. Yeah. Next year, it'd be nice to see um, uh, the matching dollars that go with each of those special revenues. If it was in here, I lost it. We did present that when we presented when I went through the various work sessions on the capital projects. Um, the yeah, I'm, I'm so, it. for example, with Flower Avenue, um, the amount that we matched is much smaller than the amount that we got. So, we, it's like right. a five to right. one but number. But it's not zero. So I yeah. Right. Okay. And sometimes it is zero. Sometimes we don't have to have any match whatsoever. Okay, so that, yeah, so the special revenue funds were way up this year, but you just addressed that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Councilman Searcy? 
Um, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, the um, city staff for the budget. Um, I don't know if you all are planning a party once this thing is done. Sleep, sleep, sleep. 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 <laughs> Pop There's, no money for a party. There's no money for the party. Oh man! No, that was. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We need we need a special reserve fund. I was gonna say that. bring a bottle of champagne, but then I thought about it. Working for the government, you can't even no, open no, it in a building. No. So, <laughs> so thank you all so much for for all of your hard work and being available to answer questions. Um, so it's been just a, a crazy ride, but a, but one that I, I'm willing to do again. So thumbs up. <laughs> and we're glad to hear that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Councilmember Kovar. Yeah, thank you. Could we just go back for a moment to the questions that uh, mm -hmm. my friend on the right, Councilmember DeBall, asked about? Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so in the whereas clauses, is the, and it's the last two, I guess it's the mm -hmm. uh, sixth and seventh one. That's right. So the policy, and you already answered this, but it's just not 100% clear to me. Um, the policy that's being proposed is that the unassigned fund reserve would be 17%. Of the general fund the general revenues. Fund. But that's not for this budget, right? It does certainly doesn't meet this. It, we do it, not. We, we in, know that in it, no way we, we meet know that, that it doesn't. Right. Right. So. But that is a best practice, um, and we'll talk about that during the work session. But I, I, I think that it, um, I think it's a very appropriate amount based on the best practice recommendations of a variety of sources. So, if we're going to be discussing that concept tonight, or, or that set of issues tonight, and then voting next week perhaps. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we vote to support a different percentage or find a different So if you want uh, to change something to so in the in the discussion of the resolution which is a work session discussion tonight then a vote next week if you want to have these numbers change um, it's second reading of this ordinance we can make that adjustment and, and change that. Okay. Um, and then can you talk about in the fall, the, the where is clause immediately after that, um, and again, I know you just talked about this in response to uh, Council Member DeVos' question, but how does the restricted bond reserve um, provide additional protection, if I can put it that way? Right, so the, um we, we have traditionally, like for the last 10 years or so, wanted to have at least $3 million yep. in our unassigned fund balance for the normal ups and downs of paying bills that we have, the standard operating expenses. Uh, we have $2.6 million in it this, this for FY19. Um, the bond reserve is dedicated funds for the, to be spent on road projects and library. Mm -hmm. um, the amount that would be spent from that uh, won't be spent all at once. Um, it'll be spent over the course of the year. It may not all get spent, depending on, especially on how the library yep. timing yep. is. So the uh, funds that are sitting in the bank, to me, give that little bit of fluff if we get really close on a particular month of, of income and outgo. Uh, bill. So I'm comfortable looking at this with other kinds of uh, reserves that we have, the ERR and that kind of thing, that, um, that that extra cushion means that I don't have to really analyze exactly where we are in a particular month. I'm comfortable that the funds are there. And we'll monitor it as we go through the course of the year. But, but if there was some total emergency, we can't just tap that money for some other purpose without. We I can't. We can't. We cannot. We cannot uh, tap the bond. We cannot tap the bond. There, I mean, there, the bond reserve. It would have to be a very significant emergency for right. us to be able to use the bond reserve. There is a provision for yeah. that, um, but we have a number of reserves yeah. that, if there were an emergency, we could do a budget amendment to change what we're doing with the ERR. We could do, you know, mm -hmm. so there are some things that we can we can do. So it's sort of like a protection 
over the ebb and flow that's that, that correct. takes place. That's correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. And we and we do also have a small emergency reserve and a couple other mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I kind of started my comments earlier, and the, you know I appreciate the fact that we are thinking about reserves and going to talk about that, and maybe uh, even set some policy on uh, what we want to do or change the policy now that we have for the reserves. But another thing that uh, I mentioned earlier in the budget process that I would like to see us do during the off-budget time, uh, when we have a little bit more time and and can talk about it, and that is the. Uh, uh, the budget process itself. One of the uh, things that I have found difficult through the years is um, being able to identify where we can really save some money and where we can uh, kind of trim budget items. Again, as I said uh, several weeks ago, you know, we it's easy to, to identify new priorities that we want to fund and uh, it, yet it's, it's hard to identify those things that we have funded and continue to fund year after year mm -hmm. uh, uh, that maybe are of a lower priority to the current council. And so I'd like us to uh, give some thought to how we can do that. I've suggested in the past several times through my time on the council that we uh, look at, uh, that we try to, to align the budget uh, more closely with programs. Um, that has not met with great enthusiasm in the past, but uh, um, I think that would be helpful in being able to identify where things are uh, costing us money that uh, maybe we have higher priorities today. And, and in which case, instead of just raising tax rates, we would be able to make cost savings that we could spend on higher priority items moving forward. Thank you. Great. All right. All those in favor of the adopting the FY 2019 budget, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. There goes our voting thank, session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our work session now turns to a discussion of pending grant applications and we have planner Jamie Ernst who's going to make a presentation on these. And I think our planner Jamie is uh, new to some of our council members. Um, and so she, she was here yep. before, um, I guess as an intern, mm -hmm. yes. but uh, we're happy to have her back on and for, as, a real, as a real planner. <laughs> yeah, as a real planner. <laughs> Welcome. We're glad to have you back. Thank you. Good evening. So it's a brief presentation. Um, so the city will be applying um, and partnering with other organizations on a couple grants, um, the first of which is a the Transportation Alternatives Program administered through the State Highway Administration, and that is for design funding for the reconfiguration of the Tacoma Junction intersection. Um, we'll then be partnering with um, Tacoma Park Cooperative Nursery School on a Community Legacy Grant as well as a National Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund Grant, and that is for the rehabilitation of 6530 New Hampshire Avenue. And I apologize, it's not on the memo. We were recently informed that the co-op is also interested in applying for a community legacy grant as well. And lastly, their um, neighborhood development company will be applying for a strategic demolition funding grant um, for the demolition of 7221 Carroll Avenue. And I should note that the last three grants, the Community Legacy Grant, the National Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund, and the Strategic Demolition Fund do not require a match from the city. The Transportation Alternatives Program does require a 20% funding match. So, so there is information about these various um, items, but basically the, trans the Transportation Alternatives Program would be one that, that we would be sponsoring for ourselves uh, through the state. Um, the others are ones that need to go through us, and we do this on a regular basis with other businesses that are applying for state grants that we um, actually kind of submit the application. They prepare the application. We submit it for them, and, uh, and it, you need to have a council resolution that accompanies it. Um, but other than that, it's, it's really kind of up to them, and these are competitive grants. So. These are standard processes. 
um, and we try to let lots of businesses know that these are options for them. Councilman Dabala? Yeah. Um, how often are these different programs open? Are they all it's essentially once it's, it's a year? It's every year. That's yeah. correct. So this is, this is the moment. Yes. And then you have to wait a year. Okay. That's right. Because um, one and possibly two of these might be a little ahead of themselves. Um, but if we can send them forward and then if things change, we can... Yeah, I think it takes quite a long time to get through the state process. Right. Too. So it's good <laughs> so to start now. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about the NDC one and then depending on what the co-op one is for. Um, right. Can so you the, say a little oh, bit... Oh, I apologize. More, yeah, say a little bit more about what the co-op is looking to do with the community legacy money. Sure. Um, and so I know for the Transportation Alternatives Program, to address your first question, so the grant is due May 16th. Um, we won't find out if we're awarded the grant for three or four more months, so that puts oh, wow. us into because September. So it does probably benefit us to apply for it now, and we may or may not mm -hmm. receive it, and we might know the, a better idea of the status of those projects. And in terms of the co-op's grant application, um, they were interested in studying the logistics of the elevator in the new development, um, the loading dock, trash, parking, um, and traffic is what they would intend to use the community operational, operational issues yes. associated with the development. Okay, great. Um, and on the first one, do we have an idea about the amount? Are we talking about 10000 a 100000 a million? So the city's, it's yeah, estimated that the grant itself, um, so we want to go from, we're at currently 0% design, and the goal of the grant would be to get us to 100% um, a, pan, a plan of packages with construction estimates um, to put that out for bid. Um, and so the estimate total would be about $800,000, and so the city's portion would be about $150,000 with the match. Okay, thank you. Councilman Searcy. So do we receive an overhead um, off the top of these grants? No. So there's no administrative. So and basically we, don't, we, we assume Other than the letting cost. people know about them, we, we don't do really anything other than actually submit them in the, on the computer. I'm sorry, was I incorrect? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's true for the application, but we manage the grants. Right. So in order to draw down the funds, the recipient contacts us. Generally what happens is it's a reimbursement. The city reimburses the recipient and then we get reimbursed from the state. Okay. So we have the oversight that the money's spent the way it's supposed to be according to the agreement and that they can give proof of, of, of the expenditures that we, we track. But we don't typically say, you know, we charge a 3% fee for the, off the total cost of your grant for performing that action. We do not, and the state grants don't allow for that. Okay. Thanks. Councilman Kostic? Related to those questions, um, I'm wondering if um, there's a limited number of applications that we typically support or can support, or is it sort of open-ended? To my knowledge, there is not a limited number. Perhaps Roz can speak to that. No, and we haven't gotten very many at a time. Okay. People have to know pretty much what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and so it sounds like the anticipation would be with the TAP grant that um, the funds, the matching funds would come from the city, not from SHA. Is that correct? I think that's true. We have a lot of conversations yet to have about mm -hmm. about how this might work. Um, and um, while we may have to pay for I don't know that SHA can do the contribution to it because of where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. There may be other ways and other funds that can, can pull into this. And uh, we certainly have uh, um, informed SHA that we're interested in pursuing this and want to work with them on it. So. Mm -hmm as best we can to not have to put our money out there, we will, although we do have some money in the FY20 budget in the CIP related to the junction. Um, so we, you know, we were anticipating at some point needing to spend something. Just, just to clarify that the TAP money is actually federal money that comes through, through the state. Through the state. The okay. state um, administers, awards those funds. So SHA 
the, the money mm -hmm. comes to the city from SHA okay. if we were to be <laughs> awarded it. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Kovar? Uh, yes, on that point, I'm sorry, you might have to come back up. Um, so it's one of those cases where the state actually decides does the feds have to sign off on it, or it's literally the state gets to make the call? The state, yeah. Call. And we think it happens in at the end of the year? You were saying that it takes um, months? Not. Yeah, the grant, we would find out whether we were awarded the, the grant three to four months after submission, so it's due May 16th, so probably September. Okay, so it's the current state administration that will be making that decision? Yes. Okay. Um, so we don't know for sure what reconfiguration we may end up supporting, right? So is right. the idea here that if we do decide through whatever process we come up with to do a reconfiguration, then at least we have this in the works? Is that is Well, this that is for planning money, so this, this helps us helps determine the configuration. There, there, we may have a good idea of the concept. We may have some good direction from SHA in advance of, of the planning work beginning. But the, the actual nature of doing the, the planning and design work is complex and it's expensive. And I, I guess what I mean is we're not yet on record as supporting a particular that's right. Reconfiguration, That's or, right. or in fact, a configuration at That's all, right. depending on. That's right. Right. So the idea is that if we do, then we're at least we have these funds That's available, right? right? So right. within that, can you? You don't have to respond now, but this question has come up a lot, and I feel like it's still floating out there. Um, this question of widening of the roads and how making a change could potentially affect that. Um, one of the points that's been raised by members of the community is that if there's substantial changes to the intersection, not, I think, like a lay-by and changing the lights and making certain streets one way or changing the crosswalks, but actually, you know, creating that island, if that's what the term is, and doing other things, that that may give um, SHA more of an opportunity to call for widening of portions of Route 410. Is that... Uh, yeah, something I, you can, uh, I don't believe that that is likely. Um, I, the, I'm certain that the city would heavily oppose right. it, <laughs> and there are areas where, not right at the, in Tacoma Junction, but elsewhere along 410 where there's historic district protection that makes a lot of difference. It's a National Register district. Mm. It's not within the intersection it's not within the junction but it's further down philadelphia um so that area couldn't be widened um the other aspect and this is just a practical one is that um the cost of that is remarkably high even for the state it's not something because we have houses so close to the streets it's just not something that um that is is a possibility i believe um, in in any way the configurations that we have seen um, studied for the junction in no way would require widening and they don't they will not be changing they, they will not make it so easy to get through tacoma park that everybody will come on 410 i mean it's just it's just not something that could, would could we have maybe that. get late I appreciate that could we maybe get later what the different historic districts are mm -hmm. and what's allowed within them just yes. so that um, yes I'm happy to share that it. again okay mm -hmm. thank you Councilmember Smith thank you uh, mr. Ernest I apologize that I didn't hear your initial presentation um, what are the dollar amounts for uh, these requests do we actually know or so for the um, the TAP grant, which requires the 20% match, the estimate right now is about $800,000. Um, and so the city's match would be about 150000 The other three grants, um, the Community Legacy, the National Capital Strategic Economic Development Fund, and the Strategic Demolition Fund, I am not certain of the dollar amounts yet, but we will certainly get that information to you. And the TAP grants, they still go through the Council of Governments, right? <laughs> um, so it's true. Planning Board? Yes, and the State Highway Administration. Okay. All right. And um, 
for the co-op's request, do they need to have a lease or a letter of intent before they make this request? Or I I do not know the answer to that. Can you, I'm sorry. The short answer is it depends on the form their application takes, and we've only had very preliminary discussions with them today. If it's capital, then they need to, um, typically they need a sign off from the property owner. If it's operational, which is what they've indicated so far, then they may not need that. It's, it's more a question of how to make the space work. Okay. So it, it depends on the shape it takes. And the capital, the community legacy grants have both a, in the past they've had funds allocated strictly for capital purposes Great. and smaller, a smaller amount typically for operational. Okay. So part of the, the process is how to package it to um, most likely ensure getting support for it. Okay, good. I just want to say uh, I, I'm glad to see that the co-op is working to stay in Tacoma Park. Uh, you know, they've been looking for space for a long time and there were rumors that they were gonna try to leave the city. So this is good. Thank you, Ms. Ernest. Sure. Council Ms. Searcy. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I have is just trying to put all the pieces together, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it seems as if uh, the um, NDC request for funds and the co-ops request for funds and the timing in which those funds may or may not happen may have implications for the overall progress that we might make or might not make on the junction. So one question that I have is, it's kind of hard for me to put in perspective agreeing to pursuing funds without having a clear agreement between the parties in which we're trying to solidify funds. I, I don't know if I'm just, you know, it's late and my mind is just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm just confused on how, like the, the steps forward um, and, you know, the timing in which we put forward um, city staff time and really trying to help push forward a grant when I, I'm not 100% convinced right now that both parties are in, in terms of moving the development project forward. I don't know if that makes sense at all. I think the, um I think partly this is the nature of, of almost every grant process that you have to work within the schedules of the grants. Um, there certainly has been some, even today, some more recent discussion mm -hmm. about coordination among the parties, which we appreciate. Um, there's, there's no guarantee either any of these would get the grant. Um, if they do, it can help things, you know, either bring down the cost of something or otherwise facilitate a better solution. Um, so we often encourage, you know, pursuit of this as a way to, to help facilitate the process. Um, yes, I don't know exactly the timing on all of these things, but it would be terrible to miss the opportunity. So that's, that's, that's our issue. No, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, whenever you become aware of funding, you jump, right? Um, but as we're kind of coming off of discussions about budget mm -hmm. and coming off of discussions about staff constraints, mm -hmm. um, we kind of have to pick our poison, right? So it would, it would behoove us to encourage entities that are asking us to help them do that legwork with pursuing funding to say, okay, well, I need to at least know <laughs> that our, our labor is not in vain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing if it's in vain from the perspective of we don't secure the funding. It's something totally different to be in, va be in vain if people are not 100% committed towards moving towards a, a solidified goal. Right. So it's it's kind of like me getting everyone to apply for a grant to paint the streets purple, and then tomorrow I'm saying, you know, I don't want to paint the streets at all. You know, that, that doesn't make sense to invest the staff time and resources into pursuing something like that. So again, I, I understand completely that with grant funding, it's important for us to meet the deadlines and move forward. But in discussions with all of the parties involved, I definitely want to encourage folks to um, get people to commit to a direction in order for us to, to pursue right. staff I th hours. I think that's all true. I th you know, part of this is our economic development efforts. It is making connections to businesses and encouraging them to 
invest in the in their facilities. Um, the the proposal for the uh, cooperative nursery school to move into the vacant white elephant building on New Hampshire is wonderful. And you know, so trying to help facilitate those things are good. It's hard for us to know as staff if everybody's got all their ducks in the row and, and if it's it's something, but um, you know, we are trying to do the best we can to facilitate the junction developments um, and, and improvements. And so these all kind of weave together, but yes, you're right, it's, it, I don't know that we have a perfect match. And I, if I would just say that um, each of the entities have to fill out their own application, um, the staff is facilitating that. I don't want to um, diminish the role that you're playing. Um, and I look at it, especially now the co-op would like to um, apply for one and take the time it takes to actually fill out the applications and go through this process. Um, I'm going to put my optimist hat on and say that um, I'm glad to hear that they had the meeting um, with uh, the staff today and heard that and, and are pursuing that, um, as well as NDC pursuing this. Um, for me, those are good signs that um, as the council is working through this process, um, people are still at the table wanting to work through this process and are optimistic that we will find solutions um, to some of the issues that we still have outstanding. If I can just add to clarify, in the past when we've when we've received community legacy grants with a partner like this, the city signs an agreement with the state that very specifically details what the budget's going to be spent on and what the scope of work is. It usually comes straight out of the application with modifications if the dollar amount is different. And the state in turn signs an, an agreement with the recipient with all that same information. So at that point everybody is is full in and now while um, the deadline is is coming up quickly and the information that we have tonight is not complete it will be very clear by next week because <laughs> next week they will be submitted by the time council is talking about this so we will have the dollar amount and we will have a scope of work and we will have more information about it and as with most grant submissions it's fast and furious up to the deadline all right, uh, I think I don't see any other lights on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we're done with that. The last item we have is a discussion of resolution setting policy regarding the level of the city's uh, general fund, unassigned fund balance. Um, and I just want to really say thank you. I'm glad that we are um, bringing this um, to the council right now. As the city manager knows and the finance director, this is something that I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, I have been through over the last decade or so, three different reserve policies, not here, but helping a nonprofit I was the executive vice president of. I'm the secretary for the um, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Board, and we just, as I was telling our finance director, redid our reserve policy there and um, helped set a reserve policy for a professional association I was the secretary treasurer for. So the fact that <laughs> we are discussing this tonight um, I think is wonderful, and I just want to thank um, the staff so much for their hard work on this. Um, I don't know if the city manager wanted to. Yes, say please. Um, so the, um, the our finance director made a presentation in October 2017, so before three of the members were on the on the council, um, and um, in that she had done quite a lot of research on. Um, we had known the best practice that the uh, GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, has for reserve levels, but she also researched what other Maryland municipalities are doing and looked through a variety of, um, of best practices. The recommended standard of GFOA is a minimum of two months of general fund operating expenditures. Um, and there's a caveat that's always mentioned, which is that different jurisdictions mm -hmm. are different, and some have higher risk and some need a larger amount uh, than others. Um, and so that part of setting a policy is knowing what your jurisdiction's level of risk and needs are um, before uh, setting that policy. And so it does not have to be identical to what GFOA says, but it, it takes those uh, policies into consideration. Um, in reviewing Tacoma Park's situation, we do have a higher level of risk than many other municipalities or governmental entities. And that is um, partly because we're so, we've got the 28% of our revenue stream that comes from 
um, county and state sources. And, uh, and we depend heavily on that. That's for our day-to-day -day operating expenses. We have gone through times when Montgomery County and the state did not pay all their money. Uh, and, and one of those times happened right at budget time, um, and it was a surprise. So we, you know, there are times when these really hit hard. Um, partly because we're a small entity anyway, we also recognize that purchasing large equipment or doing major financial projects required saving up for them. And so that's why we have the equipment replacement reserve um, and our facilities reserve. We had done quite a lot of research a number of years ago about what our day-to-day -day operating um, changes are over the course of a month, and we had had uh, kind of a working level of $3 million. It's not appropriate to say a number mm -hmm. because we have inflation or different situations. And so one of the things that we went through was, is there a, a percent level or other thing that seems to be appropriate that deals with the size of our government and the needs of our government over time? The finance director recommended that rather than use the uh, general 17 percent or two months' worth of the general fund reven um, expenditures, that we use the revenues. Our expenditure levels change quite a bit from year to year if you look historically. Um, this is often because of bigger projects or, or different kinds of um, uh, activities such as that. The revenue stays pretty stable, and if you look over the past few years, the amount that our general fund revenue has increased, it's only, it's, it's been very, very flat. It goes up maybe three hundred dollars or $500,000 a year uh, only. And so we've stayed in the, in the $24 million to $25 million range for quite some time. Um, the, um, so it does make sense for us to look at that and, and pick a percentage that's related to that, that that's pretty common um, to our normal um, expenses and, and revenue fluctuation over the course of the year. Um, when we went through and calculated that, um, it would mean that the, for FY19, 17% of the general fund revenue would be $4.25 million, which is a modest number and um, it makes a lot of sense. Just for me, working with the numbers, that makes a lot of sense for our revenue amount. We do have this special case because of the bond reserve and other things for FY19, so I'm comfortable for us not doing that, but it's really, FY19 really is an unusual year. It's got an asterisk next to it. Um, for the future, I think that we will be back to the kind of a more regular approach to our projects and, and activities. Um, and so I think the 17% of the general fund revenue uh, is a really good approximation of the amount that we should have in revenues. It's also, it sounds big, but it's actually low. Um, and um, it's something that I think uh, we can be comfortable with in saying that we're not unfairly sitting on taxpayer dollars. I mean, that's the balance part when we look at reserves. Um, and so I do feel comfortable with that. If we had gone with the general fund expenditure amount, it would be 5.4 million. And that extra million dollars, I mean, it's a quite a big amount. Uh, and so my recommendation, the finance director's recommendation, is that we use the two month, 17% amount of the general fund revenue number uh, going forward as our guide to what that reserve uh, of the general fund, unassigned fund balance should be. And I'm happy to answer questions, uh, get more information for you if you need that uh, for next week. But I, I would like to um, see that adopted. Great. Council Member Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, um, Ms. Ludlow, for looking into this and, uh, and doing so much research on it. Um, I have to tell you, though, that my uh, concern, as I understand it, is that the uh, recommended minimum uh, is 17 percent, which is too much of the budgeted general fund revenue amount, and that what you're proposing is that we go with the minimum that is uh, recommended. Uh, and I, uh, I don't agree that uh, having more than the minimum is uh, unduly 
burdening the taxpayers by holding their money because I think that uh, what we're talking about is serving the taxpayers and by uh, safeguarding the budget of the city in the future uh, should any adverse uh, situations arise. And my concern is uh, that uh, by just having the minimum amount, if a problem does come up, uh, I'm happy to have more than the minimum. I don't, I don't want to be on record that I just <laughs> keep it at the minimum. Bring so. all the money. Uh, my concern is, though, that if we, if we set a policy to just maintain the minimum as, uh, as the reserve then, uh, or the unassigned fund balance, um, that then if a problem does arise um, and we for some reason have to cut into that, it makes the following years uh, even more difficult mm -hmm. uh, because we not only have the problem that we were facing, but also the fact we were already sitting at the minimum and we have to uh, uh, increase it to get back up to the minimum. So uh, I would uh, advocate that we, um, that we set a policy that's higher than the 17 percent um, and I uh, don't have a specific amount in mind. Um, but uh, I'd like to start the discussion at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Searcy. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I echo that point. And, and to provide a little bit of flexibility, we, we could play around with the wording. Um, we're, you know, adopting something to the effect of um, at no less than recommended amount or something to that effect to kind of give us that flexibility of 17%, mm -hmm. but that's, we could go higher. Yes, um, I'm sorry. I did not mean to have this worded or give the impression that it should be really strict at that amount. Yeah. Um, one question that, that I have is, you know, the impacts, right? So mm -hmm. we just finished having the discussion about the tax rate. Right. Um, we just finished a discussion about the fact that, you know, we're resting on the bond amount of funds that we have. Um, so how do we ensure that the FY20 budget can reach the minimum, right? Um, if, if what we're saying is that our, our goal is to keep the tax rate constant if possible, we've just voted to have it lower, does, like, how are we going to reach our recommended amount of 17%? Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's something that we on the council will need to, to really think about because it, it might mean cutting more line items in the budget right. or doing what we just said we did not want to do, which is increase taxes. Now we can, we can rest on how assessments shake out, you know, mm -hmm. fingers crossed, um, you know, everyone's house triples in value or something. I don't know. Um, but that's 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 the challenge that lies ahead and and I mean again I think it's a it's okay you know based on the recommendations for us to kind of rest on the bond dollars this year but you know once the project is underway um, the library project is underway we really shouldn't rest on that right well we can't we yeah can't. right the um, I it's very useful to me when I'm kind of getting my proposed budget together to know what I need that unassigned fund balance to be. The way that it tends to work is that we um, go through uh, discussions with department heads about the various things that they have to have, the personnel items that, you know, what the, what the health insurance is gonna be and those kinds of things, um, and we get that, and then throw it all into the mix and see what that unassigned fund balance is. And it's always really low, and we go back and do cuts. And so part of that is, is a back and forth that has tended to be in my office, has tended to be at that first level before something would come to you that I make sure that the amount of that unassigned fund, unassigned fund balance is large enough. Um, I would do that again, but I think that, um, you know, especially because we've gone through kind of an unusual year, We've got the triennial assessment coming up that we will get the results of in, in February, um, that those discussions could happen and st should start happening about in February. And I think you know, it's hard to do it before then because we really don't have some data. Um, but I think that um, 
you know the the request by the council most of you, many of you are just doing it the first time and kind of getting to see where it, what it looks like to go through this process um, that we'll be able to have better discussions early on about what the implications are of some of the decisions about how big the reserve <coughs> fund should be and and what does that mean for cuts for programs and then again for the tax rate I do think it's going to take a little bit to get to get this into the system so that we can have a stable tax rate and, and that kind of thing. I mean, so there may be a year or two where we don't quite make it to the 17%, or there may be some other way that we, we take a really hard hit next year because we know we're getting there. Uh, it's the balance process that happens with budgets. Um, but I really would like to have that as a, as a cooperative project that we look at. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Dabala? Yeah, um, thank you for both, both of you for all the work. So I, I was sitting in the audience in October, and, um, and at the time I had some questions, and now I get to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look at that. How about that? So I think it's, I think it's, I really would like to set a policy, and, and I also like the fact that, that there's a way to adjust if there's a, like, for example, if we need to ease into it over a couple of years, since 17% is so much more than what we've got now. Um, is there somewhere in these materials a, a chart that says how much we've put into the general reserve fund by percentage over the past few years? So no, but that would be great. We'll yeah. look at that uh, yeah, for you. So that would be helpful because I know it's not I mean, so we, many we, percent. We did, we did look at it as, and we did some comparisons, mm -hmm. but, but not exactly that way. And so I think right. that could be useful. So I'm looking at the comparisons with the other um, communities that got handed out on right. in October. And my, so my other question has to do with equipment reserves and facility reserves. Does the 17 percent? Two questions. Does the 17% standard practice, does that assume that, 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 that any government has a separate equipment and facility reserve, or does it assume that the 17% includes equipment and facilities? N neither. So neither. Many, many, mm -hmm. okay. many communities don't have an equipment replacement reserve. We're very unique in that. So that's great. That so we that's have that. great that mm -hmm. we have. I mean, that is one of the reasons that I didn't freak out at the <coughs> two point six million. Um, it, it's a recognition that we're a small entity, and so we have that in place. Most jurisdictions don't. Um, many jurisdictions have a lot more money than we do, mm -hmm. and so they just pay for stuff out of cash, and they just, you know, sure. And so, um, so the so so, that's so part the, of this is that that it's not an apples to apples comparison mm -hmm. across jurisdictions. It's the best we could do. So, so what we have across jurisdictions is, as you say, not apples to apples. But for this, for the Government Finance Officers Association, for their recommended seventeen percent, what what do they assume is in? The, they they the don't they fund. don't really they don't spell out they don't spell out and okay. and that is because they want you to make that determination so so part of the GFOA is to ensure that 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 a council and senior staff think about what the reserve should be and and the level of risk for that particular jurisdiction. So okay. it's it's a it's a standard, but it has all kind of asterisks that you yeah, have to Yeah, and I think, think if you it. if you look on the website for the GFAO, I mean, it basically says there's no one size fits all. It's takes you have to take into consideration each locality mm -hmm. and your risk and all that other stuff. So they're very explicit that there's no one size fit all. Okay, but, great. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Smith. Uh, thank you. I want to. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ludlow, for doing this. This is something that uh, the council has talked about for a long time. Right. Uh, it's good that you know things that we bring up actually come before us and we can <laughs> vote on them. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to go on the record and say that I think the 17 percent should be the floor, not the ceiling, okay. uh, and give you some leeway on what you think is uh, the 
best practice going forward if you think we have more money then we put more money into the reserve um, now looking at the other communities is this a policy for them or are they just kind of you know many of them many of them have the policy of adopted the gfoa standard about the general fund expenditures level um, many of them don't meet it and some of the jurisdictions don't have a policy okay all right and so i saw that our friends uh, gaithersburg uh, they have a whole bunch of money <laughs> gaithersburg yeah. doesn't borrow money they just save it yes they do yeah. yes they do and they like to tell me that yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much appreciate it councilmember culver thank you um one question um following up on an earlier question thank you for all the information mm -hmm. Can we get the what all the totals of the different reserves are that we have, the ones that we have control over? I mean, sure. I think to the extent that you know the cable piece is separate and we can't really use that, but the ERR and the facilities management, just so yeah. we know what the total amount is, even though I understand that's not what we're talking about in this case, and maybe it's in there somewhere. Um, right. I'll, I'll just um, call your attention to um, the. Uh, general fund fund balance projection which is in your package it's the only one that's kind of the other direction the landscape version um, it tells the balance um, in um, in many of the different in in the different reserves okay for this, for this year well what's in there I mean they, they don't disappear oh, what's, in, what's in there yeah. Yeah. okay I see. okay so Kind of philosophically, mm -hmm. um, do you, to what extent do you sort of see the the purpose of the unassigned reserves as being to smooth out the the, the waviness versus to really be used when there's some sort of emergency? I mean, I don't know. You know, an earthquake strikes Sligo Creek, and we have to put you know hundreds of thousands of dollars into that, or, or whatever the equivalent of that would be. Right. Um, what sort of how, which of those purposes is is there and does that even include something like hey you know the feds pass a tax law and so we kind of need to shift things a little bit that year or, or some version of that so how, how do you see that i see the unassigned fund balance as unassigned so it it's a little bit it is the day-to-day -day operations more than emergencies we have an emergency reserve of four hundred sixty four thousand dollars we have um we have some other kinds of small reserves that don't count as reserves, but some small amounts of money. Um, you know, we could have a discussion that maybe we need more in terms of emergencies. Um, we have some flexibilities when there's emergencies, um, but it's a really important topic to, to go through. But emergency reserve isn't assigned exactly, right? But it's, it's for emergencies, but in an un, uh, unspecified right. way, right? That's right. And that's up to it's it's up to it, you guys to yeah, decide yeah, when it should yeah. be used yeah so um i think the numbers you're talking about then for the current year which is lower than you want and we and we understand that and appreciate that is two million six hundred thousand right correct and then for next year assuming things stayed about the same before a million yeah about four point two hundred fifty thousand so that's an increase of like one point six five million that's an estimate but that's right so we were able to pull it together to cut the budget by about you know 500,000 this year when we added back in the money for the Flower Avenue Green Street but you know that so that but that would represent a, either a an increase in taxes of like 4 cents 4 cents or finding 1.65 million dollars to cut so that strikes me as pretty difficult, given what we went through recently, and, and we also have a couple of positions that will be more full-time maybe than they were before. That's right. So one of the things I would ask and, and see what my colleagues think about also is, if we set 17 percent, do we have to get it all in the first year? And I think you said we might not, but right. I, I, don't, I don't think we really would be able to do that all in one year. So if we're going to set that as a target, I'd like to have us phase it in. Well, and that's, I mean, I think that um, that's fine, and you can either say that as a whereas clause in the resolution, um, or it can simply be part of your explanation next year when you do the budget. I think by setting it at the 70, uh, this is a question for the city manager, by, set, by doing it this way and setting it at the 17%, 
what it says to me is that what we're prioritizing in the budget for next year. And so when you approach the budget, as you said before, you're going to look at, okay, how right. can we approach that? That's right. Um, and you would come back to us with saying... I wouldn't have you have to cut a million dollars worth of a proposed budget to get the reserve. I would come in with the reserve at the right amount, right. and then you might say, gee, but we want to do some extra stuff. Or you might want to cut something that we're, as, as Councilmember Siemens talked about, that we've been doing and we don't have this high priority. As right, but, but right now, if nothing else changed, and I know it depends on the assessments too, <laughs> but there would, be a, there would be a potential significant tax increase, right, to, yeah. to achieve this. Yes. It, it's more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Council that's that's part of the reason I wanted a tax increase this year. It's part of the reason I didn't want a big tax decrease for FY18 because of the reserves. But I agree. It's gonna. It it's a it's a big lift. I just think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Council Member Costick. Uh, thank you. So. Um, I also had several of the questions that were already asked. Um, I was interested in um, comparing two percentages from previous years, mm -hmm. so that would be really helpful yes. to get, um, as well as the impact of the equipment and facility reserve funds and mm -hmm. kind of how that fits into the bigger picture of that right. percentage. Right. Um, I'm interested in exploring a little bit how um, what the impact is of tying this to the revenue instead of the mm -hmm. expenditures, mm -hmm. particularly because I was looking back to make sure I was right about this. and. The general fund revenues do also include the intergovernmental revenues. I know. So if we're setting it based on that and those drop for some reason or we don't have what we need there, how does that impact our levels and, and our kind of safety in terms of keeping that reserve level we need? I think that it's, it's, it's less, uh, to me, you could pick a higher number than 17%, but still to stick it to the reserves because the reserves have more of a stability and are more associated with our day-to-day -day operations. The expenditures, the numbers bounce all over the place, and mm -hmm. if if we ended up taking 17 percent um, of a year when we had more expenditures because we all of a sudden had more need on something, then it's going to hurt us. Even then, the tax rate really goes up. Mm -hmm. I mean, so so part of it is trying to think about that balance. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, part of the reason that that we have, I have this concern is, is the proportion of the interjurisdictional revenue. So when, if we were looking forward at the budget, would we necessarily know that there would be a reduction in those, those revenues? Um, Usually we from, do. Usually okay. we do. Um, you know, we, we had one really bad year when we didn't have very much uh, notice. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, they have been pretty consistent. If I felt like, um, if I felt that that was very volatile, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. And then it seems to me if we did anticipate that the intergovernmental um, revenues would decrease, we might actually want to potentially increase our level to a higher level than the 17%. That's right. And that would be a really that. important discussion to have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going back around again. Councilwoman <laughs> Searcy and then Councilmember <laughs> Siemens. <laughs> thank you, Mayor, and thank you, City Manager. Um, so in thinking in terms of budget formulation work that you all will do, mm -hmm. is it, I would assume that it's easier for you to hit the target when you know what the target is prior to starting formulation. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, setting that minimum, even though we as a council may decide um, that, hey, we don't want to cut, we're looking at the budget and some of our pet projects aren't there or they're being delayed or, or the like, um, and we may decide to kind of lower, you know, lower the threshold from that minimum. I think what we're proposing here is that's okay as long as we justify the fact that that's what we're trying to do. It's correct? You, rec you acknowledge it, yeah. Right. And I think that's something that's important. I think it needs to be, um, as the mayor mentioned, a priority for the council, especially when we're talking about other priorities. Mm -hmm. um, it should be a component of that fiscally responsible, you know, kind of priority that we have mm -hmm. um, and that we use this as a way to kind of set some parameters around our aspirational goals, right? right. Um, so I think that's that's going to be really, really important. I also think that um, in terms of the phase up, 
Um, I don't know if we would necessarily need to write that in the resolution as long as we set what we at least believe the floor to be. Mm -hmm. I think that might be sufficient. Um, but I think as we're having work sessions around the FY20 budget, that we are kind of working through some scenarios of this is how we could, because we're not going to be able to get, in, get there in one fiscal year. Mm -hmm. It's something that we're going to have to work towards in a few fiscal years unless we want to increase taxes. We basically want to go to what you proposed this year from where we just sat. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's it's going, and if we want to be keep the rate constant, um, depending on how assessments come back, it might take an even longer amount of time for mm -hmm. us to phase up to seventeen percent. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that makes sense, no, but it does. I mean, I think it'll it will you know it. We never know till we see the numbers. So I mean, I think one thing that would be an an action item, not just for you, but for us as well, is when we're starting to have these priority discussions, we are prioritizing the reserve level. Mm -hmm. And then as we are having discussions around the FY20 budget, um, especially because now you have the floor and you kind of set the prior, you know, set right. the stage um, that way, then we can be in a better position to say, okay, if we are proposing new things or asking why certain things are not in the budget or not being funded, mm -hmm. provide the justification. Right. If we want to move in any way, the, even the phased in amount. So let's say we decide as a council um, next year that we want to phase up to 17% in the reserves over the next eight years, making it up. Um, then what is the scenario that we would need to hit in order to get to that mm -hmm. point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as a council, we would need to kind of hold ourselves to it. The only way we're going to be able to phase up to mm -hmm. that would be based on current level numbers. If right. everything stays the same, the only way we're going to get to 17% in eight years, holding the tax rate, what it, keeping everything the same, mm -hmm. is this is this is our operating budget, and this is how we would get there. I don't know if that makes sense or no, if that's does. feasible. No, it does. I mean, it, you know, one of the things, too, is that in FY20, I do anticipate some additional revenue sources coming to the city. So that's that's mm -hmm. the other that's the other thing that's positive that mm -hmm. we have to look forward to. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just encourage my colleagues to uh, not be so fixed on the 17% number right now. It's actually 17 and a half, but even that is, uh, I don't think, adequate for where we want to be or where we should uh, strive to be. Uh, but I agree that it's going to take time to get to the proper level. So I think we should think about setting a, a minimum uh, that is uh, more appropriate for a uh, municipality that has high risk, high risk revenues, as uh, the city manager pointed out to us. But I, I just also wanted to, to mention that uh, when we're thinking about policy, it's not just setting a minimum, but also a policy for uh, when can we use that money? And I believe the city manager mentioned that earlier. Yeah. But also uh, policy for how do we maintain that fund so that after we do reach the level, and as you said, we have, a, have some kind of a, a policy about how do we get there in the beginning, but uh, we also need to say something about if we do spend it down, you know, what is our policy about re, uh, refunding that? Um, yeah, those to are, those get are it good back suggestions. up to the minimum mm -hmm. level, and those are things that should be stated in the policy. And I say that because we're not all going to be here, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. uh, we at least want to try to push the future councils in the right direction. Thank you. And with that, I was just saying that um, one thing I'd like to see is a whereas clause that says that the city council needs to review this policy every three years. Mm -hmm. and have a work session on it because I do think actually looking at you know the rec GFO recommendations and everything that you know we're striving for stability um, things change um, mm -hmm. as Councilmember Smith talked about um, in the region and other things so I think it's always good to have it in uh, our policies that we okay. must review it um, and I think with that we're at oh oh no, no I think did you, oh, are you sure? One more question. Okay, go ahead. Since, we, since we're going around one more time. Um, so we were hoping to see the percentage um, uh, of reserve set aside by year. Have there been any years where, where you've spent it down big time? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, we've been so careful about it. We we spend just, some okay, as, so as through budget amendments, but but we try not to spend it down. So so it, another piece of information that would be useful is if there are years in which some significant amount of money got 
get spent so down. I think, I, like, I think you know, another way of looking at it too is also like the purpose of the reserves is really to, to not think, do that. It's not to do that because right. if something happened, this is the money we need to tap into so that we can basically keep the doors open <laughs> and right. that we can pay people and do all that. Right. So it's also that's the purpose like of yeah, yeah, making I get sure that. we I have this. To so see if that was the case in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes we actually spend some of the emergency reserve. Right. Just yeah. a quick question. During the Great Recession, when we had to lay off people, how were the reserves impacted? We actually, we didn't cut into the reserves too much. We laid off people. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Council Member Kovar, is your light? Yeah. Yes. So just a question. Now, I know this is just a work session, but we're planning to vote. Next week. On this next week. Mm hmm So, um... I think a number of people on the dais have said that they recognize we probably couldn't get there in the first year. And to me, if that's true, then there ought to be some language making that clear, because otherwise we're just with this announcing to people that we're increasing their tax by four cents next year. And so if we know that we can't do it, I would like to make it clear that. Well, I would say saying, I would actually, but well, we can add that, but I would say it specifically says here a statement will be made identifying the special situation, the last whereas clause, I think, if I'm reading it correct correctly, mm -hmm. says that we, we there may be situations we're not doing this. So it is not a given. Right, but I mean, yeah. do, I just heard it, the majority of people say, oh, that's definitely going to happen. That doesn't sound like a special situation. That sounds like we know we're probably not going to do it. So I, I just think. If we don't think we're going to do it, we ought to say that and say we're going to try to do it in All right, so let's do a show of hands. How many would like to add a whereas clause that specifies a phase-in of the reserve? I see four. Four, okay. Um, in that, I would really like it more than $3 million floor mm -hmm. <laughs> just because of the day-to-day -day operations. So oh, well, I've just... So we, a friendly amendment can to I, that whereas clause. Can I, yeah, can I can I clarify before I uh -huh. <laughs> maybe before it will, I will change my vote. My my understanding of what this would say was that whereas we anticipate that there will be a phase in period where we may not be able to achieve this seventeen percent, but that will be our goal. Not not see. I would not say numbers. our goal is seventeen percent because what I've heard from other mm -hmm. folks is that that's the floor and we want right. to exceed that. Right. that, that and so that's why sense. I yeah. didn't vote for the whereas mm -hmm. clause because I think it's already implied in here that our goal is mm -hmm. to get to seventeen percent, um, no less than mm -hmm. I think it was said to seventeen percent, um, and I think it gives us enough flexibility that if we can't do it next year, mm -hmm. to say why we're not doing that. But I would like us with the assumption going into our budget next year that we want to see if we can get to mm -hmm. no less than 17 percent in a reserve for me that's where i was so How about if i circulate something later to everybody which yeah, would be a proposal and then, and then we can yeah, decide yeah. i mean you had four votes because so I, fine. I we can't i don't think we can do it right on the fly right yeah. now but oh yeah no, no, you can fine. do it up till right before we oh, vote. No, i'll do it sooner than that <laughs> <laughs> all right then with that we are done we're adjourned thank you everyone <laughs>